الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على السيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين برحمته يا رحم الرحمين جزاك الله خير for uh, tuning in I wanted to thank MCC for doing all the technical part and uh, Miftah Institute for broadcasting this and putting this program together جزاك الله خير for all your hard work and especially our beloved brother Abdul Wahab Mufti Abdul Wahab who uh, has been uh, in contact and such a blessing. Uh, may Allah bless him and his family and, and all of the people at Miftah who are working so hard uh, to do the best thing for this deen. We are uh, starting a, a new course and it's, um, it's an interesting course because uh, we're talking about one of the great uh, poets and uh, one of the great poets and teachers and masters and uh, thinker and visionaries in the history of Islam. As a matter of fact, not just in the history of Islam, but in the history of humanity. He is respected by uh, the East and the West. Do you mind closing the doors, please? Both of them. Um, so, one of the things that we learn in, in logic and when you start learning about the dean or if you go to university, is called definition. Like how do you, when somebody tells you something and you don't understand it, you say, define it. What do you mean by that? And that's the essential of, uh, uh, the essential about foundation of language, foundation of conversation, foundation of comprehension, foundation of understanding. It's definition. You have to be able to understand what, the other person is telling you. Majority of the uh, dispute and breakdown of the families is over definition. It's not over what they say. It's about misunderstanding and mistranslating what they're saying. That's why in English they said, you know, it was lost in translation, which means what this person said, this person didn't get. The hardest thing to define, one of the hardest thing to define is human being. Like, how do you define the most sophisticated creature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created? Because through the human being, through us, we get to know Allah. Right? We get to know Allah through ourselves. Right? And then we get to know ourselves through the light of God. And this is why Iqbal, rahmatullah alayhi, said, As hamak as kanaragir, sohbati ashina talab, ham as khuda khudi talab, ham as khudi khuda talab. He said, abandon everyone if you want to know yourself and if you want to know Allah. Abandon everyone and go to the one, the only one that knows you. The only one that knows you. The only one that knows you is Allah. Nobody knows you. You think your spouse knows you. You think your parents know you. You think your children know you or your colleague or your best friend. Nobody knows your reality. They only know what you allow them to know. But all the mysteries that is inside of us, only Allah knows that. Nobody else knows that. Allah knows why you shed that tear. You can tell people, oh, I was hurt. But the billions of cells that are just moving around to create that tear, Allah knows what you went through. All of that is known only to Allah. Allah knows your joy, the laughter, why you laughed, why you're happy, why you're sad, right? All of that, only Allah knows that. We only know at the superficial level where we say, oh, I was just, I was so happy. Okay, but we don't know really what was that happiness. So this has been the great uh, challenge of the human being in search of definition of what is a human being. Mawlana Rumi, he tried to define it by saying, di sheikh ba charaq hamigash girdashar. Kazdi wudat malula mo insana mo rezus. He said the sheikh was going through the streets in the city with a light, with a flashlight, right? Or a torchlight. He said, I'm so sick and tired of all these animals. I want to find the human being. Where are the humans? In the city. And then they said, Goftam yof mi nashawa, just stay in They said, I don't think you can find the human being. We've searched everywhere for it. Can't find it. Go on ki yof mi nashawat on amarazus. He said, I want the one that you can't find. In other words, being a human is so rare. There's a lot of human beings, 
But being a human is very rare to find. And this is why definition of the human being is very difficult. How do you define this creature? What Allah says, He says, Behold, O angels, I'm going to create a khalifa on this earth. So what is a khalifa? A caretaker, a maintainer, someone who cares, someone who loves, someone who cultivate the earth, take care of the animal, take care of the trees, make sure everything on this planet earth is fine and it's perfect the way Allah has created. That's what I'm going to make. That's the essence of the human being. Then the angel said, are you going to make someone who's going to do corruption and they're going to shed blood? See, they have their own definition. Allah has a definition. They have their de so Isn't this a person who's going to come and shed blood and they're going to do a lot of corruption? Allah says, In the alamu ma la ta'lamun. I know what you don't know. Allah knows all of the definitions. Allah knows the essence of the human being. The angels don't know what's in our hearts. Nobody knows what's in the heart of a human being. Only God knows that. Right? Only we know and God knows. Nobody else knows our heart. I don't know what's in your heart. You know what's in my heart. Allah knows what's in my heart, what's in your heart. I only know what's in my heart. Right? And that's why we judge people based on the outward. Right? We can't say, oh, that person... We don't know. If a person is, I always get criticized for this because all my life since I was a child, if somebody was nice, I always thought they were nice. They said, no, oh, guy's evil. He's just pretending to be the, their shell. I said, I, I just see beauty. And I'm just going to act by the outward. I don't know. And we will read this story from Saadi that actually clarified that point and explains it. So, we come to the definition of the human being. What is a human being? So he has a poem that is actually in the United Nations. There's a, there's a giant carpet that was gifted from the uh, Persian, from Iran, to the United Nations. And it's hanging there. And next to this carpet, there's this poem in English written as the model of what does it mean to be a human being. And this is one of the masterpieces of Saadi Shirazi, who says, Bani Adam azai yak jigarand, ke dar afarinesh ziyak gawharan. He says, humanity, they are like one body. Imagine a human being as all human being as one single human. That's what he's saying. We're all like, all of us are like one human. Because in the creation, our essence is the same. We're all the same. Whether you're black, you're white, whether you're whatever you are, doesn't matter. We're all the same. The essence is one. Our essence is all one. Nobody has a different ruh that, oh, I have a spirit that's not from the same source that your spirit. No. All of the ruh came from the same source. Right? The same ruh. Rumi said, he said, the same spirit that came into Mary and Jesus was born. He said, that was the same spirit that came into you as well. He said, bring out the Jesus in you. Right? So it's, there's no difference in our essence. So we're all the same. We might be different in our color of our skin, our height, our hair. These are all furuat. These are, these are all what we call accident. There's a lot of accident. Colors are accident. Right? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet, Shakespeare said. It, you can't change a rose when you change its color. A white rose, a black rose, a green rose, a red rose. It's a rose. They're all roses. Because the rosiness is there. Got it? The rosiness is there. So he says, we are all like this one human. We're all, the, all of the human beings. So the Africa could be a hand. Asia could be another hand. Uh, Mecca could be the face, right? Like it's... All of it is body part. And then he says, He said, when one part from this whole body of human being is in pain. Give you an example. Have you ever had toothache? It's just a little piece like this big a tooth, right? You have toothache. Is this just your tooth hurting? Your entire body suffers from just toothache. So Saadi is saying that when one part 
of this human family is in pain, he said all of the limbs of that, that, that human family should feel that. Should feel the pain of the people in Afghanistan if you're here. Should feel the pain of people of Kashmir if you're in, in Zimbabwe. Doesn't matter where. If you're a human being, you should feel the pain of other people. Right? And the least you can do is make dua for them. Some people can do things. They can donate. You know, there's a lot of refugees. People are helping. The other people make dua. And at least you feel like, subhanAllah. You know, when there was drought here in California, we were, uh, you know, my kids at school, they were like coming and they were like, no, we make sure we make wudu, we get a cup. It was really nice conserving a lot of water because there was a drought. Once the drought finishes, and I was reminding myself and everybody that don't waste water because there's droughts everywhere in the world. Don't waste water. Like have have that connection that there are people who are in need of water and they don't have water. So he's saying that if one part is in pain, every part of this body should be in pain. You should feel it. Have some type of feeling. And then he says, took as mehnati digaron bihami, nashoyat kinomat ahan odami. He said, Oh, you who are free from the pain and suffering of other people. He said, You don't deserve this beautiful title called the human being, Benny Adam. It's a title. This is the greatest title a human can achieve. It's higher than a PhD. And this is what Mullah Jami, in a, in a poem, he said, He said, Son, he told his son, he had a son. It's a story of a father and son, and the son is really, he's, 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 he has no adab but his dad. But he becomes like a, he becomes the hakim, the ruler. He becomes all this stuff, and then he's trying to humiliate his son, right? He goes to his father, he goes, Father, come. You used to tell me that I'm not even an Adam, I'm not even a human. Look at me, I'm the hakim of the city. Look at, look at my house, look at my servant, look at all these people doing ta'zim, look at my education, look at my degrees. He said, he looks at him, he said, I never told you you won't become a hakim. I said, I said, oh, my beloved son, you won't become a human. And even that was a sign of not him being a human for dishonoring his own father, right? So that's the essence what he's trying to teach here is what does it mean to be a human being? He said, if you're free from the pain and suffering of other people, you don't deserve that title. Because that title does not come free. It comes with that verse that we have made you as a Khalifa on this earth. The definition of that is that you will be taking care of each other. You'll be taking care of the animals. You'll be taking care of the earth. you take care of your own body, your own self. This is the definition of a human being. So, he wrote many books. But in these books... Uh, the most popular one is Gulistan, which means the rose garden or, or the garden. Gul is flower and, and Stan, as you all know, like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Hindustan. Hindustan is la the land of the Hind. And, you know, although Pakistan is an acronym, people think it's the land of the Pak. It's not. It was actually made of each letter has a meaning. Uh, Punjab, P, and you know, each letter has a meaning. But anyways, uh, so generally... Uh, the British are very smart. That's why they, they made that to, to sound like uh, they put this stone at the end of it. So anyways, uh, so you have Afghanistan, the land of the Afghan, right? So Gulistan is a place where all these flowers go, right? So a, a rose garden. In the Gulistan is very unique. And, and he, um, he said, Darin muddat ke mora wakta khushas za hijrat shasadu um, he says that I wrote this in the beautiful poem. He says, I wrote this book in year 655. Because a lot of the books, we don't know when exactly they were written. So that's why a lot of the poets, they write a poem when they, were, when they wrote it. So it, it's actually recorded uh, in, the, in the thing. So the Gulistan, uh, this book, this, this is not the Gulistan. This is actually a commentary on the Gulistan by, Su, by uh, uh, Sudi, Sharha Sudi. So the Gulistan is very short. Like the whole book is like probably this much or less. Uh, because it's really the cream of, of poetry. And it's, it's what they call na, uh, Nasr al-Musajjah. Nasr is 
prose, right? Nasrama Sajja is the type of prose that it, it doesn't have a wazin, like, like a poem, but it actually rhymes really well. You read it, it's, it's, it's really poetic. Uh, and he's, he is, it's called the greatest Nasrama Sajja ever written in the history of Persian uh, literature. Uh, so this is really a, a, one of my favorite books in the Persian literature. In this book, he has uh, eight chapters. The first chapter is that Sirat Apot Chahon is advice or about the kings. And they always started with that because there's wisdom in that. If the kings are straight and good, the whole society is going to be instead of tranquility and peace. And if kings and rulers are corrupt, Everybody suffers from it. And then the next chapter is on Akhlaq al-Darwishan, is in the Akhlaq or ethics or, or of the Darwish. And then that's basically every, all the citizens. So he's talking about that as a universal term. And then the next one is Fazilat uh, al-Qana'at and, and the uh, virtue of Qana'a, of contentment. And then Fawaid al-Khamushi, the, the benefit of silence. Uh, and then Ishq wa Jawani, love in youth, and then Zaf wa Piri, and then uh, old age and weakness, uh, and then Ta'seer Tarbiyat, and then the effect of Tarbiyah. Because in our tradition, we have a thing called Ta'aleem wa Tarbiyah. You have Ta'aleem, education, and then you have Tarbiyah. Uh, and Tarbiyah is that uh, Adab, what we call in our tradition, to the teaching of Adab. So, the, the Gulistan was, uh, you know, translated early on into different languages. Uh, uh, one of the first languages that was translated was in French. And uh, the, the France, uh, in France, they, they, they learned Farsi. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, one of the people who translated it into uh, German and, and French, they actually knew fluent Farsi, Persian. And so when they translated it to French in... Uh, in the 1600s, almost 350, 370 years ago, they translated into France, and the the, the first chapter was uh, given to a person who was uh, a government government official in France, Lazare Carnot, and he uh, he fell in love with it because it's an advice to the king on how to run a a government. And it's a beautiful advice. It's not, you know, now we have, you know, you have John Stuart Mill who has his ideology of how to run a government. So there's, 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 there's all these style of running the government. But Saadi has a style of running the government that is very ethical. And it's, it's uh, you know, the Persian, we have a proverb. They say, you know, do something that when, you, when you're barbecuing, because all our proverb in Persia is about food, because we always eat. So uh, when you're barbecuing, do some, because the sikh traditionally wasn't made out of steel. It was made out of wood, right? The, 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 wood, the little uh, wooden ones. So they say, when you barbecue, make sure that the sikh doesn't burn and the kebab doesn't burn, right? So that balance is very important. And that's what he's doing. He's bringing this balance where he gives advice to the kings, and then he also gives advice to the to the to the uh, citizens, like right? because it's a two-way relationship, right? So he Lazar Karnat, he when he when he read this first chapter, he fell in love with Saadi. So he named his son Saadi. He named his son Saadi. Uh, his son was a genius. He was an engineer, and he died at an early age. Uh, some say twenty-five, some say thirty-two, but he died in a very early age in uh, in uh, thermodynamic. Uh, engine that you know I mean, there was no patent back then but you know that's his his invention uh you can even wikipedia that it will come you know just put thermodynamic engine it will come Saudi Karat. and it says inspired by the great sufi uh, muslim saint of of persia saadi shirazi the name so uh so then his he has another son he, he names him saadi as well he dies at the early age. So his brother has a son named him Saadi because of the two sons that they lost and the amount of love they had for this book and for this man. This Saadi, Karnat, become the president of France from 1887 to 1894. So you have this man who inspired, his name is after a, a uh, spiritual master and a poet, Muslim poet. And there's so many, I, I once Googled Saadi Street and Saadi Avenue. All of these streets came in from France to Brazil because he was really a popular uh, per, uh, president. So uh, that they're named after him. 
So Gulistan was translated in uh, 1634, um, uh, the first time into other languages. And in, in, in uh, 1654, um, it was translated uh, into German in its entirety. And the person who translated, actually, he knew fluent Persian. He, he studied in Iran. He learned uh, Farsi. And then, um, 1848, uh, then another translation into uh, German. And all of these translations are, it's amazing, some rhymes, and, and, and they, it's, it's beautiful uh, based on the reviews that the, the, the people of that language did. Uh, the first Gulistan that was translated into English uh, by uh, Richard Burton was in 1888. So he translated it into English. Uh, but before that, it was translated as a, not as a full, just as chapter. As you know, there's eight different chapters, so some people, they uh, translated a few chapters from it. And uh, the first one was 1774, was by... Uh, Stephen uh, Sullivan, he translated into English in 1774, but not the full uh, translation. Anyways, this book has been, for the past almost 400 years, has been on the tongue of the people other than the, the Persian. Uh, they did, in, in uh, Ottoman Empire, they had it as a classical text. I know that in India, they actually read the Gulistan, and then, like, the, 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 the paper that I gave you guys, this paper... All of these poems were taught in India, not to the Muslims, even the non-Muslim schools. I, I, I met a Hindu, a Sikh lady in, in, in uh, one of my programs, and she said that she, me she had it memorized. She was in her 80s. She had half the whole thing memorized. And she read the whole poem from memory because I was six years old when I memorized it in India. She said in our school, they didn't teach it as a, a religious text. They taught it as a text of ethics to teach people ethics. Uh, so what happened is when, uh, when uh, Saadi passed away, for the next 100 years, everybody copied Saadi's style. So every book was in this style, uh, including the, there's a beautiful book, inshallah, one day I, I hope to teach the book, uh, it's called Baharistan uh, of Mullah Jami, Abdul Rahman Jami. Uh, his is probably the best one, but a lot of the people, they, I mean, I have a list of here, like two pages of list of books that I don't even know who they are, that they copied the style, but it was just like a lot of copycats, let's put it, that he started this new genre of, of how to do poetry. So, what we're going to do, inshallah, today, I wanted to go over this poem. Uh, people who didn't get it, they can pick this up. It's in here. Brothers and sisters. This is from a book called Panch Kitab. The five is called, because there's five books in one. So, the Panch Kitab is the first book we studied uh, after the Quran. And traditionally, they made us memorize this, uh, the whole book. Uh, but bad memory, most of them are gone. But uh, this, this poem, uh, the first three poems are very important uh, because they talk about, um, they do talk about uh, things that are essential in our life. So we'll do this and then inshallah, see where we go from here. So Bismillah Rahman Rahim, he starts the book with this, with the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful. And then he says, Karima bibakhshai bar halima ke hastim asiri kamande hawa. He starts the book by, the, by calling upon Allah. And this is one of the ways of, of, the, of the great uh, masters, spiritual masters. They always start their book with calling upon Allah. Uh, so he says, Karima, oh the most generous. Oh Karim, forgive us in the state that we are in. So he's not asking for forgiveness for my sins in the past, for this, for that. Karima, oh the most generous, forgive us in the state that we are in. Whatever state we're in, we want forgiveness. Because in any state, you can use Allah's forgiveness. Even in your peak state of obedience, you can still use Allah's obedience. Because you can do better. There are people who are doing better than you, right? There's always room to be closer to Allah. One of the secrets of this poem is the word karima. And this is why that book, the Panch Kitab, is also famous as the book of karima. Karim is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the one who gives, the generous one, right? 
But there's other names that Allah has. He could have used Rahima or the Merciful, right? It would have rhymed the same, right? Uh, Malika. Any of the nine, most of the nine names fits in there. But why did he choose Karima? Karim, there are names of Allah that you ask, Allah gives you. Jawad. Like you say, Ya Allah, uh, I have difficulty, financial difficulty. Allah help me, you know, alleviate this. Ya Allah, I'm sick. Heal me. Allah will do that because you ask. He will respond to you, right? Karim is the one who gives without asking. Did you ever ask, Ya Allah, make my heart beat this many times every day? So I'm, you know, we don't ask for that. Ya Allah, make me do the breathing constantly when I'm sleeping. You don't ask for this stuff. Ya Allah, don't give me a headache. Ya Allah, we don't ask for these things. But Allah, He does it all the time. He just keeps giving to you, right? He keeps giving and giving Allah. Through this name, He gives without asking. So Sa'adi is so smart. He said, if he gives all these stuff without asking, how much would he give if he asked him through that name? How much would he give if he asked him through the name that he gives without even asking? So that's what I saying. So what does he ask for? The best thing you can ask for, forgive us in any state that I am. In any state that I am. Now he is going to qualify his first line with the second line. Why is he asking that? Because... I'm a prisoner of, of my own nafs. I'm a prisoner. I know that. My reality is saying, I'm a prisoner of my own nafs. So I want your forgiveness in every state. Right? In every state that I am, I want your forgiveness. Because the nafs is like a rope that's gone around my th throat. And it's just dragging me like an animal towards the things that I don't want to go. Right? And uh, the poet said, he said, the great lovers, right, they take that rope off their neck and they put the rope of God in their neck. And that's what he said, you know, that, and then they let God take them anywhere he wants. Just take me anywhere you want, right? Because it's a rope, it's just let go, right? Let go to Allah. But he's saying, I still have the rope of my nafs around my neck and it's dragging me towards evil. So please, I want your forgiveness in every state of my life. Nadorim ghayras tu faryodras. Nadorim, we don't have, right? Ghayras tu, ghayr is except to you. And the reason why for God in Persian we use the word to. So in, in, in Persian, in the same way in Urdu we have, they say tum and then they say up, right? In Farsi, we say two, and then we say shoma. So, for example, my niece is here. She would never call me two. She would always say shoma because she's younger and I'm older, right? I can never call my older brother two because it's bad adab. I have to call him shoma as a sign of respect. But why do we call God two? He says, Nadorim ghayras two, Fariyadras. We don't have anyone except you, Fariyadras. Any Afghan wants to take a hint on that? Take it. That, no? The reason why, any? Yes? Well, yeah, that's that's pretty good. But the reason why is because Shuma is always plural as well. So as a group of people, you say Shuma. You say that respect for someone. It's like the royal we, right? Like the king will say we, it's only one, right? We are delivering this. So because it has that plurality in it, they use the word two for God. So there is no, there is no ambiguity. It's Allahu Ahad. You know, all who Allah, Allah is one. So that's the reason why they use the word two yeah, for God. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. So there's like, uh, uh, is, is that plural as well or no? No, it's singular, right? That's the difference. Yeah. Normal. Yeah, the, so the, in, in Persian, we, this is, it has the... the yeah, exactly. That's the reason, I think. That's the reason is because of the because of that uh, fear of plurality. So then he says, I don't have anyone except you to come to a rescue. Faryad ras is a very interesting word. Faryad is to shout for help. Like if you're getting drowned, la in ocean, you just shout from the top of your lungs. That's it. 
he is doing faryad, right? He's shouting, go to go help him. So he's saying, I'm shouting from the top of my lung, and I don't have anyone to come to my rescue except you. You're the only one who can rescue me. And, and this is in every situation, in your marriage situation, in your business, at your work, with your parents, with your friends, with your children, and everything you have issues, who are you going to go to? You're going to go to Allah. And if you do that calling, and this is the calling, a lot of people, you know, they say you should call like an orphan who has lost his mother and just desperately looking. And anyone that she sees with the same clothing grabs, mom, mom, just grabs it and it's not even it. But that calling is what Allah loves. When you call in desperation, he will answer. Allah will always answer that. So he says, we don't have anyone but you to come to our rescue, right? Tui asiyan ra khata bakhsh bas. Tui, you are, ya Allah, asiyan. Asi is Arabic. Any words in Farsi that has saad, da, taza is from Arabic. So uh, any word that you see in Farsi that has those four letters, its origin is Arabic. So asi is an Arabic word, which means sinners, people of disobedience. You are the one. Tui, you are the one who forgives the asi. Who forgives the asi? Well, bas. Period. Right? Bas, khalas. Finished. There's nobody else who can forgive. Who can forgive except Allah, right? Negahdar mara zirahi khata. So then at the end of this one, he says, Please, Ya Allah. Now he's doing iltija. He's asking, he's begging. Please, Ya Allah. Hold me, protect me, don't let me go on the path that is khata. Khata is, is a. Is a Obviously, it's an archery term when you miss the bullseye. They say you made khata. Khata is a mistake, right? Khata is also a sin. And sin is to mix, miss the mark as well, right? So you don't hit the bullseye. It, you know, it's the same in, in the Christian and the Muslim. The same root. It's from the same root word. So he's saying, Tui asiyan ra khata baksh bas. Right? You are the only one. So now he's saying, Protect me from this path that is khata. This path that's not going to hit the bullseye. I want you, in the in the 12-step program for the Alcoholic Anonymous, you say, why do you know that? I was I was uh, helping a person uh, with who was an, an uh, someone who was going through that, and, and I, I had to go through the 12 step to see what they're teaching. Uh, but anyways, one of the things is let go and let God. Let go and let God. Like you have to let go of that I am unable to do this. And this is why one of the things I hate about uh, corporate America, and I, I think it's, it's, so, it's, it's disgusting to see that in a Muslim organizations when people use the word I. I want this. I'm going to do this. I did this. Who do you think you are? Like how do you do it? Like how does I do anything? If the Mashiach of Allah is not there, can you do anything? Why didn't the knife cut Ismail? He tried. He got the knife, put the sun down, trying to cut, but it's not cutting. Because you can't do it. If Allah, if Allah doesn't want it, you can't do it. Why didn't the fire burn him? He, they can't. It has to be the Mashiach of Allah in order for it to happen. So we always use the word we, and inshallah we will take care of this. We will do it. Like That should be... The, the, and it would also humble people. This word I, you know, it's just, it's just so weird for me to see that in the Muslim institutions as well. So he says, Please hold us, protect us from going on this path of khata. Khata dar guzar. And now at the end, he is being smart. And it's always good to be smart. Because, like, you know, they ask Abu Hanifa, about the dua for the Kaaba, right? Because he was smart. I said, the, when you see the Kaaba for the first time, your first dua is accepted. Me and him, we made Umrah together with her too. So I always tell him, you know, what sh people like, ah, ah, you know, they ask for something. Allah, I want that job. And then, okay, you got the job or whatever. But they ask Abu Hanifa, what should we ask for that dua when we first see the Kaaba? Because you know, that's the dua that is accepted. He said, ask Allah, Ya Allah, accept all my duas after this dua. 
So <laughs> that's smart, right? So all your du'as, you become, you know, the person, everybody will come to you, make du'a for me. So he's being very smart in the last line, intelligent, and he's saying, khata dar guza. Can you just all my khata, all my mistake, all my sin, just put it aside and just delete them? And then give me reward instead. Because Allah changes uh, khata into blessings. Allah does that. He can do it. Right? He can just, all. If, if you have remorse for a sin and you shed tears for that sin that you did, Allah will elevate you a rank so high that you can have got it through worship. But you did a sin and you remorse, the remorse is so bad that you just get, get keep getting elevated. Yeah? So this is the one for Allah. Now, here's the secret of this poem. You'll get it at the end. The second one is in the praise of the Prophet And he says, He says, for as long as you have your tongue in your mouth, what's beloved to your heart is the praise of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? And it's so interesting that they knew the psychology of the self, the spirituality of the self, that there's a connection between your tongue and your heart. What's a munafiq? What's the definition of a hypocrite in our tradition? A munafiq is the one who says on their tongue what's not in their heart. That's what they say, oh, it's a munafiq. He told me I'm so beautiful, and then when behind my back said I'm so ugly. That's a munafiq. It's a hypocrite. They say in their tongue what's not in their heart, they don't think you're beautiful. But they say it to you, right? So a munafiq, he is saying here that if you want to know what your heart wants is the praise of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa That's all it wants. That's all what the heart Just If you do all day, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad in tibb al-qulubi wa dawaiha wa aafit al-abdani wa shifaiha wa nur al-absari wa diyaiha wa qut al-arwahi wa ghidaiha wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. You know, just the heart is like, give me more. Give me more. Because it's food for the heart, right? Give me more. It's joy. Just the name Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? So he said, for as long as you have your tongue in your mouth, in the way poets do, they make it so beautiful. He doesn't say, hey, just say praise of the Prophet. Everybody has their tongue in their mouth, right? All the time. So he's reminding you all the time, just do praise on the Prophet, sallallahu because that's what your heart wants. If you want, and happiness is in the heart. Habibi Khuda Ashrafi Anbiya. Now he's going to qualify why he said that. He is the Habib of God. Habibullah. Habibullah. You know, there was a, the, the Sahaba were sitting by the Hatim and they were talking. And one of them, they were talking about the other prophets. And one of them said, Subhanallah, Isa is Masihullah, Musa is Kalimullah. And Ibrahim is Khalilullah. The Prophet ﷺ passed by and he heard it. He said, well, I'm a Habibullah. And I'm the Habib of Allah. And the Habib of Allah, the beloved of God, is also a friend. Is also the one he speaks to. Is also a Messiah. All of that is in the beloved. But a Khalil is not a Habib. A Kalim is not a Habib. The Maqam is not that Maqam. The one that you love is the highest. Right? The one that you love is the highest. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he says, he's Habibi Khuda. He's a Habib of God. And then he says, Ashraf al-Anbiya. He's the Ashraf. He's the most noble of all the prophets. One of the things I love about this poem, he doesn't say Ashraf al-Makhluqat. Ashraf al He doesn't say the, the best of human being. The best of creation. He said the best of the prophets. He doesn't even want to compare him to us. He doesn't, it's, it's an insult to compare him to us. He's just comparing him to all the infallibles, the prophets who are sinless. He said, amongst this elite group of people, the Prophet ﷺ, he is their Ashraf. He is their leader. Ya Imam al Rusli, Ya Sanadi, Anta Babullahi Muhtamadi, right? He is the Imam of the Messenger. He's the best. Who's the Imam? Who do we put forth as an Imam? The best. The one who knows the most Quran, the one who knows the, has the most knowledge, the, man, the one that has the most ethics, the, most, the, most, the best akhlaq, right? And even in the Hanafi fiqh, the, the last reason is the man who has the most beautiful wife. And why did Abu Hanifa put that in there? 
Because the one who has a beautiful wife, their eyes are not on the other people. They're, 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 they're not looking at other, at other people. Like even to that level of subtleties, right? So he says, Habibi Khuda Ashrafi Anbiya, Ke Arshe Majidash Brad Mutaka. And he says, Okay, do you want me to give you more qualification of who he is? The Arsh of God is his pillow. This is one of the most amazing things that, that anybody has ever written about the Prophet. This line. Muttaka is someone that you something you lean on. So I'm, this is like a muttaka right now. And muttaka is a pillow. Like usually people get a pillow put behind their back and they lean on. He said, what did he lean on? The Arsh of Allah on the night of Isra and Miraj. Right? He went to the Arsh of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, above the Arsh, with his shoes, with his sandals. That's why we put the na'al on our head or on our heart. We have the na'al of, na'alain, you know, the, the shoe, the, the sign, the symbol of the shoe of the Prophet sallam, on our head. Right? Na'ali ke bi afghan hamim markaba das poi. He said, uh, Ansari said, do you want to know who the Prophet is? Let me tell you who he is. The mark that remained from his shoes became a crown on the head of the kings. The Muslim kings, they were Kufis with the sandal of the Prophet on their head. He said, that's the mark of his shoes. He said, that's who he is. And may it remain like that for eternity. Inshallah. So he's saying, let me tell you who he is. So you don't tell me why I'm asking you to praise him with your tongue all the time. Because the arsh of Allah was his pillow. Like he, he was above, he went above the arsh. Then he says, Savari jahan giri yakran buraq ke big zasht as kasra nili rawaq. He said he wrote this Burak. Now, one thing about the Burak is very interesting. That a lot of people think because it had wings and it was flapping probably and going from Mecca to, Mid to Jerusalem. No, Sadi explains it how the Burak went. He said the Burak put his hand forward like a, you know, whoosh. you know how the deers, they cross over a fence. They put their hands forward. He said he put his hands forward and in one hop went to Jerusalem. Just in one half. It wasn't a struggle, a flap. The wings was just decoration. That's what it was. It's just decoration, just to make it beautiful for our Prophet. And then he says, big zash as qasr nili rawak. It went through this qasr, this palace, with plethora of shades of blue lights. Now, if this is not a karamat, I don't know what it is. This is Saadi uh, was born in year uh, 1201 probably. Around 1201. Some say 1204. And they died in 1299. He was around the same time as Mawlana Rumi. But if you look at the Hubble telescope photos of the, this, the heavens, it's all shades of blue lights. And it does look like a castle lit up. Now, how did he know that? Like, it's just, it's amazing, like, the, these, these poets. So he's telling us that this is the man that went through the cosmos, went to the Arsh of Allah. He's Habib of Allah. He's the, the best of Allah's uh, messenger. This is why I'm asking you. So if you read this poem backward, all right, Always, when you read a poem forward, try to read it backward as well. Read it backward, it takes you step by step back to the point. So it will, it will actually help you understand it. That, okay, this is who he is. He went to the Arsh. He wrote the, the Barak. He went through the, the seven heaven. He's, he's the best of Allah. Now, praise him with your tongue all the time. Because your heart would be at ease and at peace. All right. So for the sake of time, uh, we'll do the last one. I usually do each one in, in an hour, hour and a half um, session with the students, but this is an online session, so we're just trying to make it short and brief, and I go too much into detail of the language. So the next one, the last one is the nafs. Now, khatab ma nafs. Khatab is from a word like we give khutbah, you know, khatib comes and gives a khutbah, right? So the first one is munajat. It's a munajat 
in for for in 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 in, uh, in the dargah of mujibu dawa the one who accept your manajat your dawa and the second one is in praise of the prophet now the third one is khitab ba nafs a lecture a khutbah to the nafs right because he knows you can't be nice to the nafs people who are nice to their nafs they're the, all those people who destroy themselves چل سال عمر عزیزت گذشت مزاجی تو از حال تفلی نگشت 40 years of this precious life that Allah gave you has passed and 40 is used as a symbolism here for a great portion of your life right? because they say traditionally by 40 you should be really sad of what you're doing because after that it's just, it's just a continuation of what you accomplished Forty years of your life passed, but your infantile state hasn't changed. You're still a child, not in a fitra nature. He's not talking about fitna nature. He's talking about childish nature. Oh, I want this, I want that. I want this, I want that. Right? Like in other words, you're still milk drinking milk, and you haven't grown to say, "Hey, I gotta, I gotta get off the breast, get off the milk." Start eating, so you know, just that growth hasn't come to you. You're still a child, right? Why? All your life, these 40 years, right? What did you do? Your companionship was your hawa and your hawas. That was your companion. Desires and passion, parties, just feeding the nafs, giving the nafs whatever it wants. Not even for a moment, you could have done something nice, something good, something beneficial, something rewarding. Not even for a moment, you, you couldn't even take a moment off to do that. All your life, you did this. Not even for one moment, you could have done that. You could have, because what he's saying, there's a taste in virtue and ethics. There's a taste. If you, if you, if you get that taste in your mouth, right? Like Iqbal says, Sajdai ishq ho, to ibadat me mazaat hai. Right? If Sajdai is done with love, you can taste your ibadah, your worship. Khali Sajdai me to dunya hai basa karti hai. Tasteless Sajdai is everybody can do that. Empty meaning this one. So that's what he's talking about. That if you do virtuous action, there's a taste that will enter that you will not do that, you will not go back to sin. And a lot of people who sin and disobey, they never really tasted the beauty of this deen. They never tasted it. They never tasted How many people have prayed night prayer when everybody was asleep and they kept praying until they broke down? And if you do that and you tell me you're going to sin after that, you come and hold me responsible. Because if you do that, one night for Allah, it will change your life for eternity. I'm telling you, it will change your life. I know people that their entire life changed with one night. But they stood in prayer and they cried and they talked to Allah until they found themselves. And when you find yourself, you find God. God is in the heart of every human being. But if you're lost yourself, right? Like the bumper sticker, don't follow me, I'm lost. If you're lost yourself, like, how are you going to find God? Right? There's a beautiful story that Saadi has about a man who wants to go to Hajj. And uh, he's going, and this man asks him, he says, where are you going? He says, I'm going to Hajj. And then he keeps, he keeps traveling. And then the man shouts at him. He says, Tarsam Narasi Bakaba e Arabi. He said, oh, Arab man, I don't think you will ever make it to, Mac to, to the Kaaba. He turns out, he goes, why do you say that? He said, Kin rahke tumi rewi ba Turkestanas. Because this is the path to Turkey. You're not going to Mecca, you're going to Turkey. <laughs> to Turkestan, right? Turkey. So in any way, the point is that you have to know yourself, find yourself, and then you'll see the, the light of God. And then he says, which line did we do? The second? We did the second? We did the one. Okay. Chil Salas Umra Zafin. Now, in Persian, he says nakon or makon is the same thing. The noon in the meme has the same, it's negation. Uh, don't 
Takia is again from the same word mutaka is to lean. Right? Takia. We say takia. I'm doing takia. He said, don't, don't lean. Don't lean on this life. Because life has no pillar to lean on. Generally, like if you go to a masjid with all the pillars, everybody goes lean on the pillars, right? We Everybody loves leaning on the pillars, especially in Medina and Mecca. And you get tired, you go lean against a pillar. He said, don't lean because it has no pillar. You will fall into this abyss. In other words, be always upright and vigilant, right? Qul amantu billah, thumma staqim. Say, I believe in Allah and then be upright, be vigilant. Right? So, In other words, don't be, don't fall into sleep. Don't relax. You always have to be like the rabbits. The ears are going, always, because predators are coming from every side. You have to protect yourself. Never, ever feel safe from the great game of life. And that is where everybody falls into. Where they think, oh, I'm good. Alhamdulillah. I think, you know, it's like I mentioned this story before. There's a man that came and, and, and I give him advice. Don't go. Uh, they were going to, to a city of uh, Sin City, a place where a lot of sin happened and gambling. So I don't want to even mention the name. And he was really into the deen, you know, beard and the whole shebang. And he said, I'm going to go with my friends. I'm going to do tabligh. And I'm going to do da'wah to them. So where are you going? He said, I'm going to this city. I said, oh man, that's a bad sign. I wouldn't go to that city. I, it's, it's, you have travel of ma'asiyah. You know, it's, it's ma, this is a travel of sin. You, 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 you're not, so, we're not allowed in Sharia to go places of sinfulness, right? You know, people. So in any case, I told him, I said, don't go. Said, no, 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 no. Alhamdulillah, my iman is good. My, you know, I, I, I studied, you know, I did, I went overseas for a year, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to go. I said, what, who is it? I said, we got a big van, this 15 passenger van, all my old friends are going. I said, man, one versus 14 is bad odds. And I even told him, even in jihad, you can run away. It's one, one, one against four. <laughs> but you're going against a big odds. He said, no, 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 my iman is, I don't know. And then I didn't see him for like a while. After a few months, I saw him, beard and everything is gone. I see little tattoos coming out. Like, oh man, what happened? And I knew I, I knew exactly what was going to happen because the odd was, you know, you don't want to go against those odds. So he's saying, don't feel safe from the great game of life. It will, tr it will find something to just drop into this abyss. And you will, once you fall into it, it's really hard to come back. And people can come back by making Tawbah, but it's just, you get exhausted after a while, and people go on a path, and they, most of them, they don't come back. But, inshallah. So, so now, look at the sequence of this. There's two ways of looking at it. So you're starting the poem with God's way of looking at things. God is telling you, listen, ask help for me. Right here, ask me. God is saying, ask me for help. I'm the one who can take care of you. You have issues in your house. You have issues with your parents. You have issues at your work. You have issues with your health. Ask me. I'll take care of you. But ask like a child. Crying, right? In desperation. Rumi has a story. He says that, uh, uh, that about, a, about a man uh, he, who owes a lot of money. This, this alim, the sheikh. He owes, a lot, he owes everybody money from the city. He just keeps borrowing. And he borrows. And people are like, hey, Sheikh, can we get the money? And he's a righteous Sheikh. Like, he's a good man. He just keeps borrowing. And then he makes food, feed people. He, keeps, he has no money. He's, he has a line of people, Sheikh, can we have our money? Can we have our money? And then it gets kind of really bad. And people are like, hey, you're, what kind of Sheikh are you? And then people start calling him name. And, and, then, so, and then this guy comes, this, uh, this kid comes, like six, seven-year-old kid. He's selling cookies. He goes, oh, he's selling cookies. I'll buy all your cookies. He said, really, he gets all the cookies, he, gets, he eats it, he gives the people, he goes, well, he says, man, I don't have any money, I'll give it to you, just give IOU, right? And this kid start crying. He's like, I'm an orphan, I'm, you know what's going to happen when I get home, please, and he keeps crying and crying. Anyways, he's just like, he just was just, what can I do, I have no money, look at all these people in line, like, you know, you stand in line next to them. And then, and then this person comes, he goes, oh, you Sheikh Sonsi? He goes, yeah, he goes, oh, 
I have this gold bag of gold coin for you, somebody said. And he goes, oh, okay, thank you very much. And he gives all the people there. And everybody's gone happy. And what was the secret of it? He said, when you ask God, you have to do it to a degree. It's like a, a pot that you put fire and fire until it boils over. He said, it was the cry of that child that boiled it over. And Allah sent the, the rescue. Because Allah knows my intention. I'm feeding fuqara. I'm feeding people. I'm not keeping any money for myself. But it had to be that. I had to take it to that level. And we ask Allah, but it's sometimes when you just really are desperate when you ask. And I've seen it. I've seen it with my own eyes. People who went to Umrah with us. And they, had, they went with like such difficulties. And I, and I know like a, a woman went with us. She said, uh, you know, her son couldn't have children. And they were married for over a, uh, over a decade. And uh, she said, the only reason I'm going is just to ask Allah. And just, I said, just, just go to the, 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 the cabin and just hold on. And she went and she held on and she was crying for hours. And she said, you know. And then so uh, two years later, they went back with the child and the son and the daughter-in-law. And as, as to give gratitude. That, you know, Allah, thank you for that. But it has to be real. You know, it can't be this fake lip service. Ya Allah, you know, give me this, give me that. So he starts from that. And then he's saying, you know, my prophet, that's my beloved. Send prayers upon him. And then he's saying, listen, you want to be successful? You have to take care of your nafs. You have to control your nafs. Now, our perspective, we, this nafs, we look from down up. We got to take care of this nafs first. And then, once you have the nafs in control, I got to praise the Prophet. Once you have that, then it's just, it's a, you go through this because all the doors have been shut to God except the door of the Prophet. That's the only way you can get to God. The time of Jesus was through Jesus. At the time of Moses was through Moses. At the time of Ibrahim was through Ibrahim. But now, until the Yom Al-Qiyamah, it's through the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allah Jazakallah khairan. And uh, I don't have my uh, for the. Uh, let me see if there's any text. So Alhamdulillah, I think we're done. Inshallah, if there's any any questions from here or online, I don't have my uh, my laptop next to me. Maybe Sidi Munir can send me a text. Clear? Was it clear? Okay. Yeah? All right. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidil Mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika ashadu an la ilahi illa tastaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi. Wa ala asri inna al-insana lafi khusr illa al-lazina amir wa amir al-salihat. Tawasu bil-haq wa tawasu bil-sabah. Zakallah khairan. Inshallah ta'ala. Next Saturday we'll start the actual gulistan of Sa'adi with the Dibacha. Inshallah. بالله الذي لا يضر مع اسمه شيء في الارض ولا في السماء وهو السميع العليم ولا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم جزاك الله خير um may Allah bless each and every one of you who are people who are here and people who are watching um we are continuing on the gulistan of saadi uh, the garden of wisdom and the week number 2 of a uh, four week program last week we talked about the great poem of saadi on the definition of human being and uh, we also did a uh, uh, from the, his famous uh, write, writing uh, a book called Karima or Panj Ganj, uh, we did the first uh, three poems on, on Allah and on his messenger and on the nafs. Um, so today we're going to actually start the, uh, the uh, Gulistan itself. But before we start, one of the things about Sa'di that, that separates him from a lot of the people is that he, uh, you know, his name is Maslahuddin. Uh, he, the, the son of Mushrifuddin, um, he, his father, used to work for the Atabak uh, government as a low post. Uh, and he was born in Shiraz, the city that he really loved. There's so many poems uh, about Shiraz and his Gulistan that really melts your heart, the amount of love he had for his city. Um, and a city of, of poets, a city of, of scholars, 
many of the great scholars such as Hafiz came from Shiraz and, and uh, other uh, notables. But he leaves Shiraz at age 16. He's, about a, he's a teenager and he leaves it. And he, and, uh, and he goes on this travel, this, this journey. And this journey is for him to find himself, to find his Lord, and to understand the religion that he is part of. Because one of the great scholars, uh, we asked him, American scholar, he said, why did you become alim? Why did you? He said, I just wanted to learn for myself. I just wanted to learn the religion. Because somebody was saying, oh, no, this is haram. Somebody was saying, this is halal. I said, you know what? I want to learn this myself. What is this? So a lot of these people, they didn't go to learn to become a scholar or become an alim or become famous. They wanted to learn because they had the love for Allah and His Messenger and they wanted to know about their deen. So he goes on this journey and one of the amazing things about the year of his birth, he died, he was born in year 606 of Hijrah, which is the same year that Fakhruddin al-Razi died. So as always you would see with the death of a great uh, scholar, you know, the birth of another scholar happened. But people are unaware of it because he actually, Saadi emerges way, uh, he, he leaves when he's about 16. He's, he's gone for about 32 years on this travel. He just goes, he goes to Nizamiya, the famous university that Imam Ghazali used to teach there uh, by, by Nizam al-Mulk in Baghdad. And uh, Baghdad is a Persian word. It's Farsi word. It's not Arabic. Bagh is means city and Dad means justice, the city of justice. So he is there and he studies at this, uh, in one narration he studies 17 years there. And then he not only studies, but he becomes a teacher there. And he mentions the beautiful line about Imam Ghazali who was there before him about 120 years before Sa'adi. So then he keeps traveling, he goes all around the world. He ends up in, you know, goes to India, goes to Habesha, uh, ends up in China. He's, he's a world traveler. But during his travel, he is, you know, the Quran says, travel and see the, see the author, see what we have created, and also see what we brought and what we destroy. So it's a lesson to see these things. My goodness, look at the Roman Colosseum. At one point, they were the rulers. Now it's just a bunch of rocks remaining, right? So this is just a uh, learning about life. So he travels and he goes, and then he gets, uh, this is the time of crusaders. So he actually become a prisoner of war. And they put him in these, they, they dig tunnels. So they put him in the tunnel and he's digging. For seven years, he's digging tunnel uh, for the crusaders. Then the, the Muslim government, they actually, uh, they actually buy all of the prisoners of war and they give them, gold instead of to, to do a trade-off. And one of the people that gets free is Sa'di from this uh, dungeon that he was in. But what struck me the most, and people who have read, I know Sidi Hashman and they all read uh, Gulistan multiple times. What has struck me most about his work, you don't see any sad line in there where he complains, oh, these crusaders, they did this to me, I was in the dungeon. And he doesn't complain about anything because they believed in Qadr. This is from Allah. Who brought the crusaders? Allah brought them. Who brought the Mongols? Allah brought them. They always looked at themselves and they said, what wrong have we done that we deserve this? If we fix ourselves, then Allah will fix our situation. Right? Then Allah will fix our situation. But if we, don't, if we keep blaming others, oh, it's the American, it's the Russian, it's this, it's the Cuban, it's the... We, can, we are not looking, you know, uh, uh, one of the great Indian poet Ghalib said, he said, Omar par Ghalib yehi bool karta raha, dool chehre par te aur aayna saaf karta raha. He said, you made this mistake all your life, O Ghalib. The dirt was on your face and you were wiping the mirror. And that's what a lot of the modern people are doing. They're wiping the mirror and they're not looking at themselves. And the journey of Saadi is a journey of looking at himself, finding himself in order to find Allah. Because if you are lost, there's a beautiful bumper sticker that says, don't follow me, I'm lost. If you're lost yourself, you can't help anyone and you can't get to any direction, any the place that you want to go. There's an amazing story in the Gulistan. 
of Sa'adi who was about this man who's going to the Hajj. So Sa'adi sees him and he says, where are you going? He says, I'm going to the Kaaba. And then he starts, he start, the journey just keeps going. And Sa'adi shouts at him, he said, Tarsam narasi ba Kaaba, ay Arabi, kin rahka tumi rawi ba Turkestan ast. He said, I don't think you will ever make, make it to the Kaaba because this is going to Turkmenistan. He said, you're going the wrong direction. So the point of his travel was to learn, right? We have cre not created the jinn and the human except to worship us, Allah says. But how do you worship Allah? Through knowledge. You have to know how to worship Him. You have to know how to make wudu, how to pray, how to... There's, there's rules and regulations that you have to learn. So he learned all of that to worship Allah in the most appropriate way, in the way that Allah wants him to worship him. So he goes on this journey, and when he comes back, right? Sadi inat baqadam raft wa basar He said, I went on my feet, and I came back on my head. It's a beautiful Persian proverb. You know, in Arabic, they say, ala rasi, ala aini, you know, on my head, on my eyes. We, the Persian, the same thing. We say, Basar Chashim, the Chashim, you know, on my eyes. I've, I, there's many meanings for this line, but I think that what he's saying, I went as a person of the nafs. My feet was in the dunya, in the dirt. But I came with a head, an intellect, right, that is connecting me to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Because intellect is that light, is a light, is a nur. So he, he comes back and so after 32, 33 years of, of just traveling, he comes back and he, he uh, the king uh, of the time, Sa'ad Zangi, and that's why his name is Sa'adi, because his name is not Sa'adi, obviously his name is, is uh, Musahuddin, but he takes the name Sa'ad because of Sa'ad uh, Zangi, Abu Bakr uh, Sa'ad Zangi. He was the Khalifa of that time, of uh, the, the, uh, the Atabaks. He loves him, and the king loves him and honors him. And this is, it's very important to know, these are not like, you know, we have in our modern time, oh, ulama sultan, these are the scholars at the feet of the, the sultans. No, no, no. These are the people who rectified the sultans. They, because if the top is right, the bottom is going to be right. If you have a corrupt leader, then and I don't have to mention anything about any of the, the people in the world, Look at the Muslim world. Look at the world. But look at the Muslim world. Look at the world. I mean, only a couple of countries you can say, okay, there's a good leader, and look at the society's flourishing. Everybody's happy. But if you have a corrupt leader, it trickles down all the way to the corrupt police officer on the street. So they were trying to fix things from the top bottom because it's much easier to do that if you have access to that. So because they had a lot of love and respect for Saadi, he would give him. And so in 1258, 1255 uh, of the uh, Gregorian calendar of the Christian uh, era, he literally like the bee that gives honey when it's ready. The entire book just came out of, of the Bostan. Like the entire book, he just... But, you know, once Sheikh told us a story about Haji Nur al you know, he has no Haji Nur, the calligraphy, right? There's two calligraphy of him right there on the, on the wall. Haji Nuruddin, this, this uh, amazing Chinese calligrapher, he does Arabic style Chinese. So somebody went to him and he said, hey, can you, can you write my name on the paper? And he said, yeah. So he went like, he said, what's your name? He told uh, his name and then so he went like that. Here's your paper. That would be 30 bucks. And the guy said, that took you like 10 seconds, $30? He said, yeah, it took 10 seconds, but it took me 30 years to master it. It takes time. And a lot of the people, if you look at the history of Islam, they wrote their books at the end of their lives. Nobody wrote books when they were young. Everybody who wrote books when they were young, they regretted it. Like, for me, I taught a, a, a class, a few classes in Mulana Rumi, and that, and like in 2013, 14, and I wish I could go back and just delete that and redo it. A lot of people say, no, it's a great class. I say, yeah, but I wish I, what I know now is like, Oh, I shouldn't have taught that class. Literally, I, it, it could be done much in a much better way. But anyways, so he came and then, so he just gave like birth to this book, the, the Bostan. Bostan became the most popular book in the Persian literature. So after 
in the in the Persian literature, uh, it, it's the Quran, the most printed book, and then uh, Hafiz Shirazi's, the sec the the most printed after the Quran in the history of Persian literature. It's it's the Diwan of Hafiz, and that's because the Persian, the you know, especially the Iranian, they, they love that that book. And then it's the Gulistan in the Bustan of Saadi. So it's like the most popular books that you can have. One of the things about Saadi, when he went on this journey, he slowly found himself. And a lot of people, they want to find themselves in one day. They want fast food spirituality, fast food fiqh. Like, hey, I want to become a faqih in three months. Is there a course? No, there's no course for three months fiqh. There's no course for three months spirituality. It's a lifetime journey. You go on this and you get it, you know. But Mawlana Rumi said, he said, once you put your first step on the path, you're already on the last step. Because he said there's 99 steps to God, right? It's step by step until you get to the divine presence. He said, you, the re, he said it's just protocol you have, to, you have to do. That's all. The rest of it is protocol. But it's the first step which is the, the hardest step to get, to turn away from your nafs, your ego, your desires, and turn toward Allah. So on this journey, he meets a lot of the ulama, including uh, uh, Ibn Jozi, not the famous, but his grandson, uh, who was also a great scholar. He studies under him, and, and he has a beautiful poem. He says, Mara shikha donoi murshid shahab, du andars farmud bar rui ab. Yaki on kadar nafs khud bin mabosh. دیگر آن که در جمع بدبین نباش. He said this great sheikh, uh, uh, sheikh Shahabuddin, uh, uh, no, Abul uh, Faraj, he said that he gave me uh, uh, two advice when I was with him. He said the first advice is never, never uh, see faults in other people. Like when you see other people, don't see faults in them. You know, one of the scholars said, you should treat everyone as a wali of Allah, as a saint. He said, how do you know they're not going to become saint at the end of their lives? So that idea of looking at people with husn dhan, with good opinion of people, having a good opinion, not su'uzan, not having a bad opinion of a person. And the people who want to know about this in English, young people, uh, there's a beautiful talk that John Foster Wallace did. A uh, commencement speech is called This is Water. It's on YouTube and it's worth watching because the whole concept is about Husna Zan and Su Zan about the world. Like, how do you look at the world? Uh, so he said that he told me that, okay, don't, 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 don't see faults in other people. But he said also in yourself, don't be pleased with yourself. Don't be a person. It's an age of nafsi, nafsi. It's me, me, me. I'm so amazing. I'm so. Everybody's like about themselves. And they put all this stuff, a quote from themselves, like, oh, I'm so amazed I said this thing. And you, really, it's funny. Like, a lot of these things are, you, you, you don't know whether to laugh out of, uh, because, uh, you know, sometimes the worst of stuff makes you laugh. So he comes back, but what does he achieve in this journey? The greatest thing that Saadi achieved in this journey is visible very clearly in in one of his poems, which he says that he finally fell in love with Allah. Love is a, you can't claim love. Those who've been in love, they know, right? Those who know, they know. Those who don't know, they don't know, right? This is, the, the, this is what uh, uh, Mawlana Rumi's father, somebody asked him about love. He said, those who know, they know. Those who don't know, they, I can't explain it. You can't explain love. So he said that uh, when he came back, he said, I fell in love with Allah. And all I could think about is my meeting with him. That's it. And the Hadith Qudsi says, if you make all your anxiety, one anxiety of meeting Allah on the Day of Judgment, Allah will remove all your anxiety in the world. If your concern is all like, I'm going to meet my Lord. What? But his concern was different. It's not about, oh, is he going to forgive me? Is he going to throw me in a hellfire? What am I going to... That wasn't the way. He said uh, that uh, he 
his uh there's a beautiful poem uh, about his death uh, yeah I, I actually uh, I'm losing my memory because uh, I, I got only two hours of sleep last night but anyways yeah okay so he says در آن نفس که بمیرم در آرزوی تو باشم When I give my last breath and I die and I say goodbye to this world and leave the world I would die with this immense desire and hope of just seeing you But don't امید دهم جان که خاک کوی تو باشم and I'll give my soul and die because I know I become the dirt of your dominion. I become the dirt that you created. با وقت صبح قیامت که سرز خاک برارم با گفتگوی تو خیزم با جستجوی تو باشم. And on that day of reckoning, on the day of judgment, when I rise from this grave, I would rise with my first speech is, where, where's my Lord? I'm, I'm talking to you. And everybody is, in the day of judgment, is nafsi nafsi. They're trying to find something. He said, I'm just trying to find you on that day. I'm in search of you on that day. People are running away. That You know, يَوْمَ يَفَرُّ الْمَرْءِ مِنْ أَبِي وَمِنْ أَخِي وَأُمِّهُ وَأَبِي وَصَحِبِهِ وَبَنِيهِ and this is the day, you know, the children are running from the parents, the parents from children, the mothers from the, the son and the dog. Everybody's running away from each other. It's nafsi nafsi day. He said, even on that day that everybody's running away from each other, I'm running to you, Ya Allah. Hadithi rawzan naguyam. Goli behesh nabuyam. I don't care about paradise. I don't care about the roses of paradise and the scent of paradise. I'm not even going to smell. The roses of, I'm not even going to tell all the stories of paradise. You know, people said that they talk about paradise, all these amazing stories. He said, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not even going to smell the flowers of paradise. Hadith Rawza Naguyam, Gule Behesh Nabuyam. I'm not going to do any of those. Because why? Because all I want. Is to see you. I don't care about these things. All I want is to see you. That's it. Because the vision of God, you know, in, in, in Ramadan, there's a beautiful hadith of Sa'im Farhatan. A fasting person has two joy. Farhatun in the iftari wa farhatun in the liqai rabbi. The joy of breaking his fast and the joy of meeting his Lord. And the reason fast is not for eating food. People make that mistake. They say, oh, eating food and break. No. Completing this act of obedience that you abandon from everything, it's so, the, the reward of it is so immense that on the day of judgment, you will just be in the state of ecstasy, just realizing how much reward. And then the next one is seeing Allah on that, on that day, right? مَيِّ بَهِشْ نَنُوشَمْ زِدَسْتَ سَاقِيِّ رِزْوَانِ مَرَا بَبَادَ چِي حَاجَتْ كِ مَسْتَ رُوِي تُو بَاشَمْ I'm not going to drink this pure wine of, uh, of paradise from these, you know, this maiden of paradise, the saqi who's going to give me the wine. I'm not going to drink that. He said, why would I need wine when I'm already intoxicated with you, with your remembrance? And there are people who are intoxicated with the remembrance of Allah. Anyway, so this poem, I think, summarizes Saadi's life about what happened to him. He became a lover of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a servant of Allah. So then he gave these two books in 1255. He gives us the Gulistan in 1256. He gives us the, uh, the Bustan 1256. The next year, he gave us the Gulistan. Gulistan became the most popular book in, in, in Persian uh, literature. And, you know, we study Gulistan at 7 to learn the language, but we study Gulistan at 70 to understand what is he talking about, to learn about our lives. 
So it's, it's, a, it's a book for all ages. So the book is, start with a debacha, which is the uh, preface, or uh, uh, he has this beautiful, uh, and I just picked a few lines just to go over so people can see what he's talking about. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, he said, Minnat khudayra azza wa jal, kitaatash mawjib qurbat ast, wa ba shukr andarash mazid al-ni'mat. هر نفسی که فرو می رود ممد حیات است و چون برمی آید مفرح زاد پس در هر نفس دو نعمت موجود است و بر هر نعمت شکر واجب This is called نصر مسجع This is a, a, a uh, It's not a poem And this is a prose But it's a prose that actually it rhymes as you read it But it's not, it's not, it's not a poem And Saadi is one of the The, the, the one who uh, started this uh, style of writing and everybody copied him. We talked about that last week about the, the style of writing in, in, in detail. So, he said, Minnat Khudaira Azza wa Jal. Minnat or Minna in Arabic is praise, it also means indebtedness when you're indebted to somebody. In other words, I'm, I'm praising Allah and I'm indebted to Allah. Right? Azza wa Jal is, is honor, Aziz is short for Aziz and Jalil as well. The two names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kita'atash, that his ta'a. Ta'a, again, is Arabic word. It means uh, worship, right? Kita'atash, his ta'a, his worship. Mawjib qurbatas. That it brings you closer to him. So what is he saying here? It is very important for people to understand this concept. He is saying, that praise be to Allah that when you worship him he draws you near to him you get close you get this maqam of qurba you're not going to get any wealth you're not going to get good health you're not going to get money you're not going to get a car you're not going to get anything of the dunya when you worship Allah why is that? because as salatu nur the hadith said, prayer is light. Worship is immaterial. So the reward, like, هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ Isn't the reward of something beautiful, something that, that, that is the same? Why do we fast six days of Shawwal after Ramadan? To show, our, one of the reasons, to show our gratitude for Allah. Thank you, Allah, for giving us Ramadan. So we're going to fast for six days the same jins, genus. To say thank you, Allah, for Ramadan, right? So he's saying that Allah is going to give you qurba. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. So if Allah gives you wealth for your worship, or He gives you a nice car, or He gives you a nice house, that is dhulum, that's oppression. And Allah is not a dhalim. Because on the day of judgment, you will hold, you will hold God accountable, which you can't, but you will say, I worship you, and then I got a car? What is that? Because the qurba of Allah, this closeness that you get, is priceless. And that's why worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is priceless. So this is the reason. So now he's saying, But if you're grateful, Allah will give you more ni'mah. Allah will give you good health if you're grateful for your health. Allah will give you more money if you're grateful for the money. Allah will give you beautiful children if you're grateful for your beautiful children. لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ The Quran is a formula. If you're grateful, it's a conditional sentence. If you're grateful, Allah says, I will increase you in that to be more grateful. Right? So like a lot of people say, how how you doing? Oh, I'm sick. I have so much pain. And then you ask him like two years later, how you doing? Oh, I have even more pain now. Well, you didn't learn the lesson. You complain, Allah will give you more to complain about. But if you're grateful, Allah will give you more to be grateful. And this is why our grandmothers, that generation, they never complained. Shukur alhamdulillah. They were in pain. Shukur alhamdulillah. Like always shukur alhamdulillah. But that's how they got better because they were in the state of shukur. Now, who are the people who are shakir the most? The ulama. The scholars, they're alim, they know this. 
They know this verse. They're always instead of shukr. So what is, then why do you have scholars that are poor? Aren't they grateful for the, for the food that they get? Aren't they grateful for the clothes that they have? Aren't they grateful for the little hut or room or tent that they have? Why isn't Allah increasing them in that when they're grateful and they're poor ulama? And I've seen poor ulama. Well, here's the reason. The first station of gratitude is to look at the ni'mah. Ya Allah, thank you for this shirt. Ya Allah, thank you for the clothing I have. Ya Allah, thank you for the house that I have. Ya Allah, thank you for the... That's the first level. Imam Ghazali says it very beautifully. He said, there are people, they see the pen. So, oh, that pen writes really well. There are people who see the hand. Oh, that hand writes really well. And then there are people who see the artist. Wow. That artist. These scholars, they no longer see the pen or the hand. They see the muna'im, the one who gives the ni'mah. That's what they see. So their shukr as well is giving them qurba to Allah. Because they are, what is their shukr for? Ya Allah, it is you that's doing this. Allah is giving them more of that that they're grateful for. They don't see the world. It has, it's meaningless to them. Everything that's the world and in it is meaningless. So then he says, Har nafasi ki furu mi rawad mumid the hayatas. Every breath. And I know like the, the, in our tradition of one son, we had to memorize this when we were like seven years old. I know like people sitting here, they, they just read it from memory. But every breath that you inhale, it gives you life. It prolongs your life. If you don't breathe in, you can't live. You die. Right? Wuchun bar mi oyad mufarrahizad. But when it comes out, it actually gives you good health. Now, this is one of the karamat of Saadi. How did he know that? That when we exhale, everything that is not needed in the body, it actually takes it out. So you have a healthy body at every breath. Allah is doing that. Giving you life, keeping you healthy. Giving you life, keeping you healthy. So he's saying that, so know, my beloved, that in every breath, there are two ni'mah, there are two blessings. One for inhaling to get life, one for exhaling to keep, it, keep you healthy. So there are two ni'mah and every blessing. Isn't it mandatory to be grateful for every ni'mah that Allah has given you? Shouldn't you say, Ya Allah, thank you? For this blessing. And he's saying this is where, you know, and, and, and the chess game is checkmate. He, Saadi just checkmate all the human being. Literally, he's like, okay, you think you're Abdul Shakur? Let me show you. For every breath, two shukur you have to give. So, now, because you have to be grateful to what Allah has given you. So now he says, as das to zabone kibar he says, show me someone who has a tongue in the hand to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to this degree. Who? And the reason uh, in the Sharh of Sudi, in the Gulistan, he said the reason why he used the hand is hand is not just the hand. He's talking about the jawarih, the hand, the feet, the, 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 the eyes, the ears. Because they all have their shukr, right? They have to give shukr for every limb of the body, right? The kidneys, the heart. So he's using one as a representation of your entire body. So he said, whose hand, in other words, whose limbs and whose tongue has the ability, the power to be shakur? Oh, family of Dawood, the Quran says, be grateful, work, and be grateful. Because Allah says, very few of my servants are grateful. Very few of my servants are grateful. So he says, then he write, it has a poem now. He said, so here's what I'm going to give you an adv advice because there's no way you can be as grateful as Allah has given you the blessings, right? 
He's not telling you not to be grateful. You should be shukr throughout the day. This is a beautiful maqam. A maqam that someone is a shakir. Always. And you can see people who are shakur, they're always happy as well. Because they see everything from Allah. But he's saying, it's better that all of those servants who has shortcomings, which every one of us, have, anybody say I don't have any shortcomings, they're either insane or they're an angel. Everybody has shortcomings. Kullu ibn Adam khatta'un, the Prophet ﷺ said, every son of Adam will, will sin, will disobey, will make mistakes. Right? So he's saying, so let me give you an advice. It's better for all of us who have shortcomings that we just go to Allah with brokenness. And just say, Ya Allah, forgive us. Forgive us. Because no one on this planet can be grateful to the amount of blessing that Allah has given them. It's impossible. Nobody can do that. Right? So, but gratitude has station as well. It starts with the with that station of seeing the ni'mah, and then goes all the way to seeing the one who gives you the blessing. Right? Seeing Allah and everything. That everything is in the hand of Allah. This is the station of happiness. This is when you're really happy. You have, won't have any problem. If you, build, if you have that as a model of your life, that everything has, it's from Allah. So what can I do? You know, like we, uh, you know, just a personal story. Uh, our accounts got hacked and somebody like, Took all all our stuff. It just I woke up the next day, everything was gone. Like everything you had in your whole life, it's just gone. Like there was nothing in there. Kind of panic. I'm going to account account change, password change. I don't even have access to anything. Literally nothing I have access to. So I was sitting there. I was like, you know, you get devastated because it's like, okay, who's going to pay the rent and who's going to pay all this stuff, the bills and everything? Because you, you have you have zero money, literally. And 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 all your you know all your investment is just gone. Somebody just uh, anyway. This was a few months ago. Be careful. Everybody should have extra security. This is the number one thing now happening in America is is uh, is, is fraud uh, on your uh, bank accounts and on cryptos and, and and other stuff. But anyways, so I was sitting with my wife and I. And you know, you always, you never want to break these things down like that to your wife. Say, okay, we lost everything. Because, you know, it's very difficult for them because they see you as the one who's bringing, working and bringing the money and they have that security and, and tranquility. And they, they can really, you can shatter their, the whole world and, and they, they get depressed on, over these things. So, so I was breaking it out easy. So, you know, this account was, one of my accounts was hacked and this and that. So, okay. And I, and I thought she was just okay. I said, I said, you know what, you have to make really du'as because all our accounts was hacked. And then she looks, she goes, did we pay our zakat this year properly? I swear to God, first thing, did, did we pay our zakat properly this year? Did we count everything properly? I said, I think so, but I can double check. Uh, I usually pay more in zakat. She said, we must have done something wrong. And that was our whole thing. And for me, it was like a paradigm shift. And I was like, I've been reading these things, but she's living those things. Like, it's different, you know, the people who have that connection. So, and obviously, you do what you have to do. But, you know, it, it took a while, about three, two, three months. But alhamdulillah, we, we were able to recover a lot of stuff. So, but anyways, the point is that you have to realize everything is from Allah. And what wrong have you done that this come to you? Like people always ask about political situation in our countries, and I just you know it's the the best example is Sayyidina Ali when they went to him and they said when Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Omar were in charge like look we are like amazing Khilafah no fighting no now ever since you know Uthman and you took over like we are fighting and we have all this corruption and all this stuff what's you know what do you say to that he said well. When Abu Bakr and Omar were the Khalifa, you know, they had people like Uthman and me under them. Now we have people like you under us. <laughs> That's the difference, right? So it's, you know, you have to really think about yourself. Again, we go back to that Ghalib poem that, you know, you can't keep wiping the mirror and saying that, why, 
why have dirt on my on my on this no it's not the mirror it's you you have to wipe your face and clean it but people don't want to do that but gratitude has station the greatest station and this is what you could have in, in the knowledge you have ilmul yaqeen aynul yaqeen wa haqqul yaqeen three levels of knowledge right so this is ilmul yaqeen you're learning something yeah aynul yaqeen is seeing that thing in practice like what I, the story i told you i saw this in practice and when my wife just practiced that, I, I, I witnessed it. But then there's haqqul yaqeen, living that, is that experiential. So Mawlana Rumi said, he said, if you look at the lovers, he said, shukrana dadi ishqra as tuhfahahu malha. He said, you are so grateful for your beloved. You love someone, what do you do? Give them flowers, you know, give them a Gucci purse, give them all these gifts of the world. Because you love them, right? you buy all these stuff. And you give them the diamond ring. He said, that is at the very beginning of gratitude. That's at the beginning. He said, anybody can do that. Anyone can do that. They can buy flowers and they can buy stuff and give it to people. He said, you want to know the highest level of gratitude? Why don't you become the gratitude and become the gift? That you are the gift and you are the gratitude. So when you go home, you are the gift. She doesn't need a gift because you have become the symbol of gratitude and a gift. That the, if they ask your wife or your spouse, what do you want as a gift? I want my spouse to come home. Well, what about a Lamborghini? I want my spouse. What about an ex? I want so that is the high level, right? The same thing with a teacher and a student. When the student says, oh, my teacher, because he is the gift, right? So he continues. Just want to make sure we have time. Baran rahmat bi hesabash hama ja rasida wa khan ni'mat bi dariqash hama ja kashida. One of the things about these lines, those who speak Persian, Farsi, or Dari, you would see the perfection in the language. There's nothing you can do to make it longer and make it better. There's nothing you can do to make it shorter and better. You can make it shorter, but it's not going to be as beautiful, as meaningful. You can make it longer, it's not going to be as beautiful, as, as meaningful. It's perfection of language in Persian literature. The reign of his mercy that you... The, Innu innumerable. You can't count the reign of the mercy of Allah. The reign of His mercy has reached every corner of the world. Allah has two names at the beginning of the nine and Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. Right? Rahman and Rahim. The difference between them, both of them are mercy. One is universal mercy, one is particular mercy. The universal mercy goes to everyone. Whether you believe in Him or don't, it goes to you. Whether you're a Muslim, a, a kafir, a fire worshipper, an idol worshipper, an atheist, an agnostic, whatever you are, you get the universal mercy. You get the food. You get the clothing. You get the oxygen, the air. You get the health. You get the friends, the family. All of that universal mercy Allah gives you. But then there's a specific mercy that's only for the believer, right? So he says, Barana Rahma, this is the Rahma universal, the mercy universal, has reached every corner of the world. Is there a place that Allah is, you know, a, it's, it's, you can't see the hand of providence there. Wakhan and Ni'mat be the Khan means, you know, it's short for Dastar Khan, we say in Persian. It's the, the, the cloth that you eat on, right? The, the, the tablecloth, what we call it. And the table, the cloth of the Ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has reached every household. Everybody gets their food, everybody has food to eat. The reason why each and every one of you are here today is because your parents had food from the time of Adam alayhi salam till now. If they didn't have food, they would have died and you wouldn't be here. Allah, Allah provided the sustenance for them. He's a razaq. In our aqidah though, Imam Tahawi says that we believe that Allah was a razaq before he created people that needed risk. So he didn't get the name Ar-Razaq because 
He had to give us rizq. Even before there was a creation, Allah was our razaq. Right? Parde namus bandagan ba gunah fahish nadarad. This is uh, just again perfection of language. Parda is a, is a curtain. Parda is also a veil, right? The veil that's between you and humanity. There's a veil between me and you right now. There's a veil between you and I. Only you know yourself and Allah knows. Nobody else knows you. We know you based on how you tell us who you are. And we know you, some of us know you based on our view of you, our perception of you. And this is Mawlana Rumi's cry was that Everyone became my friend and got to know me based on their opinion of me. Nobody wanted to, nobody was interested in hearing what I have to say about myself. Generally, that's the rule. That's the case. People just, they assume about you what they want to assume. They don't care to listen to what you say. But the only one who knows you is Allah in yourself. That then Allah put a veil between you and the humanity. Right? Khuda gar parda bardarat. Sarui kar adam ha. Razak fani. Famous poem. That if Allah removes the veil from the work of human being, from the actions of the human being, He said, how many fasik will become mullah instantly? And how many mullahs will become fasik instantly? Right? That's the reality. Right? The Hafiz had this problem with all these preachers because they came with their Aba and their turban and their Qaba and their all, you know, their, this jalwa, right? right? This jalwa this, this, it, that they, they, they put on this show on the member. And he says, What is on King Jalwa that Mehrab and Member Mikonan? Chun Bakhilwat Mirawan on Kore Digar Mikonan. He said, Look at the, all these wa'is, all these preachers. They come on a member and they put on this jalwa, this show. It's beautiful. Right? The turban and the abba and the speech and the eloquence. He said, but when they're in their private life, they do other than what they preach. In other words, Fafi is saying, what a blessing that Allah has failed because otherwise you would, you would not even listen to most of the people, right? So, he says that the, this veil of your namus, of your privacy, of your honor, of your dignity, of your soul, of, your, of those things that are precious to you that you don't want anyone to know. Allah does not rip this curtain so people can see. Right? He does not. Even if you sin, disobey him and you fornicate. Even the fornicator, Allah doesn't show them that this is, person is a fornicator. Allah doesn't do that. He veils you. There's a secret in that. And I, and I will talk about it. وَوَزِيفَيْ رُوزِي بَخَطَاءِ مُنْكَرْ نَبَرْ In this sustenance, the allowance of your sustenance, because everybody has an allowance, right? So whatever you get, that's your allowance. That's why you should be happy with whatever you have. Allah has already written what you're going to get. You should work. You should strive. You should, you know, you know, Allah is giving you hands and feet. You can't. Saadi has a beautiful story. Uh, I was planning to do it, but it's a very long poem. But it's a beautiful story about about a a, a ruba, a a um, in a lion. Uh, um, so this 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 uh, ruba fox, right, or, or coyote, fox. Yeah. So this fox is crippled, is handicapped. So this man passes by and goes, Subhanallah, how does he eat? How does he get his food? And then he sees a lion goes and attacks a deer and, and, and hunts it and rips the deer apart and eats it and then he throws away all the extra food that he's full, just throws it in the air. And it lands right in front of this crippled fox. And the fox starts eating this meat. So the next day he goes, he says, another incident happened. This lion did it. And then he throws in accidentally or whatever. It's just he's like, subhanAllah. Allah is a raza. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to do any work. I'm going to sit. So he said, he just sat down and said, I'm going to get my risk. 
Allah is feeding the crippled <laughs> fox. He's going to feed me. So he sat for a day, two days, three days. Nobody's bringing any food. No family, no friends, nothing. And he's starving. And he's starving. And one thing about spirituality and tasawwuf, people, you know, one of the practices of the, the people of, of on this path is they don't eat a lot. And the reason why they don't eat a lot, because when you eat, you, you fill yourself and you can echo. When you're empty, you echo. That is the echo of truth, but we don't hear it. That's why when you go in a valley, and there's a mountain on the other side, and you say something, it echoes you. It echoes back to you, right? So after a few days, when he's so his stomach is empty and he's like starving to death, he goes, "What's going on? Like, ya Allah, you know, you you give the crippled fox, and I've been starving, and I'm a mu'min, I'm a believer, and I do dhikr. I didn't get any food. I'm dying, right? And then the echo of his own soul says, "Barawshira darandabosh ay dhal." Go become a lion. Be a roaring ro lion. Don't, don't sit like a crippled fox. Right? Don't sit like... Allah didn't create us to be crippled fox. He created us to be lion. Go out and do it. But know whatever you get, it's from Allah and it's written for you. Allah is the one. He gave it to Mayasha, whoever he wants, whatever he wants, whatever quantity he wants. And be grateful, and Allah will increase, as the poet said at the beginning. So, this is very important. Because you see a lot of atheists and agnostics that are super duper rich. They don't even believe in God. So he says, Allah will not cut the salary, what is, you know, what is supposed to go to them if they disbelieve in him. If they sin and disbelieve in him, Allah will not cut their salary. They can have it. Why is that? Why is that? Because all of this world and everything that's in it, everything in this world, and everything in the heavens and the earth, the galaxies and the star and the moon and the sun and all these, now they're saying in Mars that these stones are worth, they're priceless. All of them, you combine it, one breath in paradise is more expensive than everything in the world in here. In, in this One breath. Not the exhale, just inhaling. Because with the first inhale of paradise, every pain, every suffering, every anxiety that you had, everything just gets washed away. And you enter the state of ecstasy and happiness. Complete joy for eternity. So this world, if it had any, any value, Allah wouldn't give those who disbelieve in them, a, a morsel of food. But it has no value. It has nothing. And only people who connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would know this. Because through that connection, you would come to know. So, he says, Dostan ra kuja kuni mahroom tuki ba dushmani nazar dari. He said, oh Kareem, we talked about why they use the, the name Kareem last week. Because Kareem is a name of Allah that he gives without asking. But if you ask through that name, how much he would give? So he says, oh Kareem, that you have these unseen, inexhaustible treasure houses. And you're giving to, to fire worshippers, to disbelievers, to atheists and agnostics. You're giving them this... This is, look how you're treating them. You're giving them food. You're giving them family. You're giving them friends. You're giving them good health. You're giving... How could you deprive your friends? When this is the way you deal with your enemies, if this is how you deal with your enemies, how would you deal with your friends? And Allah is the wali of those who believe. And a wali is a protector. is also a friend. Allah says, I am your protector. Allah is the protector. Allah is our wali. Allah, this is the relationship that Allah has put. How could he deprive us from, uh, from this uh, if he is uh, doing uh, this generosity he's showing to, uh, to, the, uh, to those who disbelieve in him?
it's 3.59. I had a little bit more to go, but I don't, I don't think I can finish it. But, um, but I'll just finish this uh, um, just briefly because uh, I want to respect the time. We started a few minutes late, so that's, I think, the reason. But generally, 4 o'clock, we should wrap up. Maybe a couple of minutes, inshallah. So he says, هر گاه یکی از بندگان گناهکار گناهکار پریشان روزگار دست انابت به امید اجابت به درگاه حق جل و علا بردارد ایزیت تعالی در وی نظر نکند He said when a sinful servant who is instead of disobedience and then, and then he feels remorse and he goes Ya Allah, Ya Allah please forgive me Ya Allah, Ya Allah give me this Ya Allah, Ya Allah and Allah is not even looking at him because he's just a sinful horrible servant right Bazash bakhonad, baz ikhraz karad. Then again he goes to Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, and Allah does not look at him again. Like, I don't even want to look at you. Because it's a sinful disobedient service. Bazash batasarru wa zahri bakhonad. Wa haq subhanahu wa ta'ala mi farmayad. Then he goes in, and, and this is what we talked about last week, is when you go to Allah in a state of brokenness, and you just break down, and you just cry, and you become your own self. You're not doing this as a show. Where it says, Ya Allah, no. It just, language, you know, Chand as in Izhar or Izmar or Majaz. Chand as in Alfaz or Izmar or Majaz, Rumi says. How much of this, you know, the eloquence you're trying to put on, your metaphors and your similes and all these. So how much of that? Allah says that, Suz khaham, Suz ba'an, Suz saad. I want burning. That's what I want. I want people to come to me where the burning voice cry, break down. So he goes, the next time he goes, he keeps going and going. And Allah doesn't want to look at him. And then he goes and crying to Allah. And then, Ya Malaikati. This is a hadith Qudsi that's in this book. Again, uh, for the, a lot of people who are on the path of knowledge, uh, especially at the Miftah Institute, this is a poetry class, so it's not an, an aqidah or a fiqh class. So just we'll take the poetry part, and then if you want the isnad for the ahadith and this and that, you can and most you can you know look those up. But most of these things are used in order to teach us a lesson. So sometimes they use ahadith that are weak, but the meaning is sound. But they they're using some of those in order to teach and drive a point home. So this is not a, a hadith class. قد استحييت قد استحييت من عبدي وليس له غيري فقد غفرت له دعوتش را اجابت کردم و حاجتش برآوردم که از بسیاری دعا و زاری بنده همی شرم دارد and then Allah says he said I accepted his prayer and I gave him what he wanted because I feel embarrassed from this sinful servant just keep asking and keep asking to forgive him. So he ends this conversation by saying, Karam bin o lotfi khodawandagar, gunah bandakardas, go usha and so on. He said, Look at the generosity of Allah. The sin is committed by the servant. Allah feels embarrassed. For what he has done. The servant is sinful. Allah says, I just feel embarrassed like not answering him. Even though he's a sinful servant, I'm going to answer his prayer. So, these are the teachings of Sa'adi Rahmatullah Ali. And I think that in our time, we're living in, in, a, in a very interesting time where people are kind of disconnected from themselves, from the reality, from Allah and his messenger. And you would see in the next session, inshallah, we'll talk about his connection to the Prophet ﷺ, which is really uh, marvelous, uh, you know, how much love he had. We wanted to today showcase his love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and his journey on this path. But his, his, and then inshallah, we'll do stories from the Gulistan where the, he teaches the, the kings, he teaches the, the, the citizens, he teaches the lovers, he teaches the people of Adab. I mean, he just, he's a teacher. He's an amazing teacher. 
uh, they fall on the footstep of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who was the, the greatest teacher that ever walked on this earth. In the mabuath the muallim, I was sent only as a teacher. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. Uh, so uh, it, it's it's amazing to be on this on this journey with these people. I love these 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 teachings because it melts the hearts. It makes us human being. It makes us people that we can actually connect with ourselves, connect with Allah, and use these in our daily lives. These are not uh, things that you can just read and just put it on the shelf. But no, rather, it, these are things that you can practice and put in your life. And, and I think that to start the day is that we all should start doing uh, gratitude practices. And one of the things that they have done in, in the modern science, they did uh, people who have depression, they, they did a study that if, if, if they do uh, gratitude practice where they every day they would say, oh, I'm grateful for this, I'm grateful for this. And they mention a list of gratitude, some say 10, some say 5, but it actually removes their depression. So I think that if you can do that, like every day we, when we pray after after the prayer, just, just be grateful to Allah for, say, Allah, thank you for good health. You know, it's, just people, you know, we, we think good health, we, it has to be part of our life. No, Allah can make you sick. And once you're sick, then you would know the value of good health. You don't know something until you lose it. So just, uh, just if you do that, that's, you know, for me, uh, this is, you know, some people might like it, some people might hate it. But if you do a lesson and you, and you don't take anything home to practice, you just wasted your time. Uh, so if we just do that for, for this week where we do a gratitude practice that every day we just show three things a day. Just say, Allah, if you have good parents, there are people who have horrible parents. I know converts that, you know, they had really bad life growing up. Uh, so if you have good parents who are loving, gratitude for parents, gratitude for children, gratitude for good health, if you have a roof over your head. if you, I mean, you because the blessing of Allah, you cannot enumerate. So you can just go on for eternity and just thank Allah for all the stuff that he is, everything that he's doing, and also things that he's going to do in the hereafter, inshallah. So Zakallah khairan, if there's any question, inshallah, but if not, uh, thank you for uh, the team here at MCC for making this happen, the hosting uh, here locally, and then thank you for the miftah, uh, all the brothers, uh, may Allah bless all of you and the team there. Zakallah khairan, inshallah, we'll hope to see you next, next Saturday. For the third session, inshallah. Zakala khair and salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah rahman rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala sayyid al mursaleen wa ala ali wa sahbi ajmeen. Audhu bi kalimati illahi tamati mi shari ma khalaq. Bismillahi alladhi la yadurru ma asmi shayin fi al-ardi wa la fi al-samai wa huwa al alim wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim. Alhamdulillah, Zakala khair for everyone who is here. Um, thank you to uh, MCC and Miftah for making this happen. Jazakallah khair for the hard work of all the brothers and sisters at Mifta, uh, Brother Mufti Abdul Wahab especially. May Allah bless all of you and protect you and increase you. Um, we are on the third of the uh, fourth week of Sa'di, the Gulistan of Sa'di, uh, which is a book of wisdom in reality, a book of teaching of uh, the great Persian Gnostic uh, master of Kalam, of and also he was he was known as wordsmith uh, because he had such a uh, eloquence in his in his language, uh, very precise and meaningful and beautiful at the same time. So uh, one of the thing about uh, words are that a lot of time when people speak, it goes through our ears and we we hear things uh, and we listen to things. But sometimes when people speak, it actually goes straight to our hearts and. Those are the words that, that has meaning in our lives. And when, when somebody says something and it affects you spiritually, not just through your ear, but it, it affects you uh, spiritually and you get this awakening through these words because the words that rise from the heart enters the heart. The words that comes from the mouth, it, it doesn't pass the ears. And these people, if you look at their lives, they were like the, the, the honeybee. It takes so long for it, but once they're ready, it just comes out. And it, everything comes out from the heart of the human being and goes into the hand and into the pen. And for some, it doesn't even go to the hand and the pen. 
it just comes out from the tongue and other people write it because they're all already in a state of complete love and, and just love of Allah and the messenger that they don't even have the, the ability in those moments to write it. Like Mawlana Jaladina Rumi, who didn't write anything of the Masnavi except the first 18 lines. The 26,000 lines of the Masnavi was written by his students as he eloquently just said uh, those lines, proclaimed them, and just uh, recited those lines. So he, Sa'adi, rahmatullah alayhi, his words are in reality words from his heart. And he, uh, one of the things that, that words that comes from the heart is it's not fake, it's not phony. It's not a lecture you prepare and say, I want to say this in order. There are, there are signs of, of uh, speech where you learn that you know exactly when people are going to clap. You know exactly when people, so you, and they, they say those lines and they have a pause in that moment because they know the clap is going to come next. It's, a, it's an art and anybody, if you have the time and, and people want to do that, they can learn that science, which is a waste of time because, again, you're doing it, you're doing it for the clap. And this is one of the things in our religion is jaza and wifaqa. On the day of judgment, whatever you do, for whatever intention you did that for, that's what you get. So I give an example. If you donate money in order for people to say, oh, what a rich man and generous man he is. He just donated a lot of money. On the day of judgment, when you want your reward from Allah, Allah says, no, you didn't donate for me. You donate it for the people who can, they, they would say, oh, what a generous person he or she is. And they said that about you. So what do you want from me? You got your reward because you wanted it. So the same thing with a person who goes to the battlefield, the mujahid. He says, I'm going to go to the battlefield so they can say what a great warrior I am. So on the day of judgment, he says, Allah, give me my life. He says, no, no, you didn't, give, you, you didn't give me your life. You gave you a life for this act that everybody says what a what a warrior that man is so everybody said what a warrior that man is so what do you want from me jaza and we fought. you got your reward already from the people so they didn't write their books to be bestsellers but allah makes things bestsellers right so every hadith uh, scholar they write a book called the arba'in the 40 hadith there's so many arba'in 40 hadith uh, that's been written in the history of islam there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, whoever learns 40 hadith and practices that, he will be with me in paradise. It's a beautiful thing to memorize 40 hadith and practice those hadith. So that's one of the reasons why a lot of scholars write the, the Arba'in, the 40 hadith. Now, if you look at the history of Islam, what probably hundreds, if not thousands, of Arba'in was written, 40 hadith. There's only one Arba'in of Imam Nawawi that just goes generation after generation after generation. It gets translated into like Persian and Urdu and French and German and English and Russian. All these languages and it still keeps going, right? When you say, we say Arba'in, say Arba'in and Nawawiya. The Imam Nawawi is 40 hadith. Why is that? There's a Kabul in that. He didn't do it to be the bestseller, but Allah made it the bestseller. Because his intention was for Allah. I want to do this for Allah and for the love of Allah and his messenger. So these people, when they wrote their poetry, they actually wrote it in order to, because they had so much love. And you can see that love in the poetry. There's a man, a beautiful man. He was not a Muslim in Punjab. And he, and as, if, as you all know, in India, and in, uh, was modern day Pakistan in India, they used to study Saadi's Gulistan and Bostan as a, as a textbook, not as a book of poetry. And this is one of the, the, the tragedies of our time that we study these as, as poems. But they didn't study as a poem, they studied as a book of uh, uh, philosophy, they studied as books of politics, they studied as books of akhlaq and ethics, because all of those are in these books. They're trying to teach lessons through their stories, and inshallah when we get to some stories today from the Gulistan. But this man was reading, he was not a Muslim, he was a Hindu. And he was reading the, the Bostan of Sa'adi. And the Bostan of Sa'adi starts with a, uh, with a beautiful praise of Allah and his messenger. So he's reading this, and it's in his biography, biography and, and, I, and I have, and he's really an amazing uh, man. Uh, and, and then uh, 
his his, uh, his I think his great granddaughter is still uh, that's the one that I got a copy from their library that has his note on the book a photocopy of it uh, one of the beautiful people in, in Pakistan uh, they, they saw that they they sent it to me but anyways he he reads this poem. And so he, he's, he's studying this book. So he reads the Gulistan. He comes to this line on the praise of the Prophet ﷺ, and he keeps reading and reading. And he said, when I got to this one line, my tongue keeps repeating the same line over and over again. When I got to this one line, it's like, you know, when the CDs get stuck and they just keep repeating, they go in a loop. He said, my tongue went in a loop, and I couldn't go to the next line. I couldn't move to the next line. And I kept repeating this, and I kept repeating this. And this is the line where Sa'adi says, Mahola Sa'adi's kirahi safa, tawandaf juz bar payi mustafa. He says, Sa'adi says, and he says to himself, and this is one of the things that when the poet give an example and they use their own name, Iqbal does that all the time, uh, you know, Hafiz does that, Sa'adi does that, Mawlana Rumi does that. All of the poets, they use their own name, right? So he says, Oh Sa'di, right? In other words, I'm giving this advice to myself. It's the greatest advice, so take it. If it was bad, I wouldn't give it to myself. He says, Oh Sa'di, it is impossible to be on a path that is pure. It's impossible to be on a path that is pure because the path that's pure would lead you to a place that is pure. Al Jannah Nazif, paradise is pure, it's clean and pure. And you have to have this path of purity to get there. You can't be on the path of Khubas, of filth, and, in, in, and expect to be in paradise. No, each one has a road. Paradise has a road, and hellfire has a road. So he's saying, Sa'adi's saying, if you want to go to this perfect place, right, a place of beauty and perfection, it is impossible to go except to walk in the footstep of Muhammad al-Mustafa. That is impossible. To get to paradise, to be with Allah, to be on the path of purity, this is impossible. Mahal as Saadi is impossible as Saadi. No way that you will find this path except you walk in the footstep of Muhammad al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this man said, my tongue it started to get into a loop and I couldn't go to the next line. And I keep saying this line, keep saying, and he breaks down. And he says, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. So he becomes a Muslim and then he, became, he goes on the path of learning and spirituality. And his name is now, uh, his name was uh, Baba Shami. He has a big shrine in Punjab and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people go visit his shrine. And he had, thousands of students and become a big, big scholar. He has a book, the Maktubah, he has letters, a uh, beautiful uh, book. Um, so become a big, big scholar and, and, a, and a spiritual master as well. But that was all from this one line of Sa'adi's Gulistan. So people have been affected. We talked about uh, Lazar Karnat in the first session about this Frenchman who reads the Gulistan of Sa'adi in the seven, in the 1600s and he uh, uh, he names his son Saadi Karnat, and then his, his son passed away at age 25. He names another son Saadi Karnat, who becomes the president of France. And they, you know, in the history of, of France, they have a president named Saadi Karnat. And Saadi, it says, named after the famous Persian uh, poet and spiritual master. So, uh, Alhamdulillah, these people had an effect because these words were not simply written to be famous or written to be get, get an award. But it was, they were written because they had immense love for Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Saadi, we will, uh, for the sake of time, uh, we will start uh, the Gulistan on the first Bab. Bab is a chapter, and uh, in, in they say Bab Awal Dar Sirat Shahan. The first Bab, the first chapter. Sirat is obviously is the same word we use for like Sirat al Nabawi, you know, when we have books of life of the Prophet. It's so he's talking about the Sirah of the kings. So he's going to give us uh, what should be the akhlaq of the king. 
this is a uh, this is a formula for how to be a leader because each person is a king but they're unaware of it we are the king of our home if you're a father you're the king of your home and everybody's your citizen you're your wife and your children and your so you have to take care of him so how do you do that if you're a minister you're a king if you're a governor you're the king of that that state right you're a, if you're a mayor you're the king of that city so there's there's level so his advice is not just for the king as a pacha or badsha or 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 a, or a real king or a president but it it goes from the top all the way to the bottom all of them how to deal with uh with with this situation that will come to you so he starts with uh, the hikaya number 1 we'll start for the baraka we'll start the first story from the gulistan uh in chapter 1 uh of on the uh the characteristics of the kings bismillah rahman rahim padshah ra shanidam ke ba kushtan asir isharat kar this is he said I tell you a story I heard about this king who had a uh, someone who Asir is a prisoner. We talked about it in the first session. So he the, the king just you know Ishara is indication. So a lot of the kings they say go ahead and kill him, go ahead and put him in prison. They just have symbol. They just go like that, right? So he does the Ishara and then like that, get rid of him. So he's a, whatever he did, I don't know. Maybe he was guilty. Maybe it was dead treason. So there was something that he did that, right? The king. Bichara daran halat nomidi malik ra dashnam dadan girif wa sakat guftan. This bichara, obviously, bichara is the universal word now. Everybody knows uh, this devastated poor man in this hall. Uh, Saadi says in this hall of of hopelessness, right? So here's a man who's standing there. The king says, kill him. He, okay, end of my life. He's just hopeless. There is no hope. Hope is what makes us, gives us sanity. Hope is what makes us go forward. Hope is what makes us eloquent. Hope is what makes us beautiful. Because you have hope that things will change. Right? But now he has no hope. It's done. The king already commanded that he should be killed. So at this point, he became hopeless. He started cussing out the king. He just started saying foul word. Whatever it came out of his mouth, he just said it to the king. که گفتن هر که دست از جان بشوید هر چه در دل دارد بگوید and Sadi says there's a famous proverb everybody all these wise men said whoever's life is over whatever's in their heart comes on their tongue they can't be a monafik at this time to say oh thank you king you're amazing no I'm just going to say you're horrible you're this you're that whatever comes out I'm, you're going to kill me so why should I be nice to you right in my heart I hate you and I'm going to say I hate you so then he he writes a poem to explain this further. That was a prose, and this is the poem. That's called Nasr Musajja, a, a a prose that actually has some type of rhyme and beauty in it. Wakt zarurat chunamonat guriz das begirat sarasham shiratiz. At the time of darura, and darura is when uh, in necessity. So we have darura in, like for example, if you're starving to death. Right, and there's no food, it becomes darura, like okay, and then there's things that are haram for you to eat becomes halal. Right? Because your life is more important, right? The preservation preservation of life is the first thing that Sharia comes, right? To preserve life. Maqasid is Sharia, one of the five maqasid. One is the preservation of life. So in that time you can eat pork, which is haram. But you don't eat to say to 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 the fullest. You eat enough that you keep yourself alive, right? And until you get to, to real food. So this is daruri. So he's saying, so this is the time of when it becomes daruri time, like essential, just desperation time. He said, your hand will catch the swords if it comes towards you. So if somebody's coming with a sword on your head, you will catch it with your hand because you'd rather lose your hand than lose your head, right? So that's what he's saying. إذا يأس الإنسان طال لسانه كسنو this is the the should be a كسرة on that not a فتحة يا كسنوري مغلوب يصول على الكلب so uh, that should be a كسرة uh, Sudi said it's a كسرة so I I trust him more because he's a grammarian on his sharh 
but this the uh, the other uh, books they have it as, as a fatha. So this Arabic line it says when people become uh, they have yes they, have, they become hopeless. He said their tongue becomes long. He said just like a cat when he comes face to face with a dog and there's nowhere to run and hide and it's like okay this dog is going to eat me. The cat start fighting the dog. So he, the cat knows he's going to lose. There's no way. But it starts throwing. He said, like, okay, I, I, I'm just going to go. I'm not going to go out like this. I'm going to go out with a, with a bang, right? Malik Pursi Chimi The king asked, what is this man saying? What is he shouting about? So obviously the king is sitting on the top. And then there's all these wazara. And then there's the people. And then there's the man standing at the far. So they don't have access to the king that close. He can't hear the man. And I think that's one of the reasons why the king didn't raise his voice because by he, he wouldn't be able to hear it. This is before there's microphone stuff like that. He just went like that. Yakiya's wazaroi nig mahzar gof. One of the wazara, the wazir, is a minister. It's someone who's next to the king, and he's he's a good wazir. He's a, he's a man of good character and good akhlaq. He says, "Ay khudawand hami guyat." And khudawand here doesn't mean God. It means master. Right, Khudawan, Khudawan, the God. They use it in Persian poetry. Uh, it doesn't mean God itself. Khuda is God, right? Uh, so he said, "Oh, this Asir, uh, he's saying, Wal Kazimin al Khayz, Wal Afiin an Nas." It's a reference to uh, Surah Al Imran. There's a beautiful verse about the that he is saying that you know those who people who stifle their their anger. Literally, they eat their anger. When they're angry, they just they, they, they just suffocate their anger, and they forgive people. Malik <laughs> rahmatullah. The king had mercy. Man, I just told him to kill him, and then he's saying that you know those those amazing people. What are they that they have? You know, when they're angry, they 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 you know they take their anger down. Right? This is the sunnah, and then and they forgive people. They have you know forgiveness. So the king had rahma. So he said, no, 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 don't kill him. Let him go. He's free to go. Wazir Digar There's another wazir, another minister, and he he doesn't like this wazir. He is the opposite. Like there's the ethical one, there's anything. So one is a Democrat, one is a Republican, right? So it's like in, in our country that would be the the style. Abnoijin Samo. People like us, in other words, we are the wuzara, we are the right hand and left hand of the king. We are the people who are supposed to, you know, represent to the king the cases in its true form. We shouldn't be lying about this. Like, we shouldn't lie to the king about this issue. We should only speak the truth to the master, to our king. In uh, in this man just cussed out our king, and he said foul stuff about him. Malik Rui Azin Sukhan Darhamawar. He said the face of the king kind of like when you start he start frowning with this word that he said. Wagoft, and he said, "On duru kawaid pasendi da taramad mara zin rost ketu gofti." The lie of this wazir. I actually liked it more than the truth you just spoke. His lie was more beloved to my heart. I liked it than the truth you just spoke. Kerui on dar maslehati bud wa banoi in dar khubse because his lie had benefit. His lie had benefit, but your truth, the foundation of your truth, was dirty. You know, in this culture, say, man, that was just dirty, right? That's exactly what he's saying. You were just dirty today. That was a dirty game you just played. Here's a man, you know, saved his life. He's going to change too, right? Because now the king forgave him. And so the thing is that also about these stories, one of the things that some of the lies that are permissible is that when two people are fighting, right, families feud and, and, and community feud, but people are, oh, I'm not going to talk to him again ever. He said, da, da, da. and then you're trying to make peace with him. He said, you know what? I was with so and so. And he said something. It was like, man, I miss so and so. He's such a good man. 
We used to do barbecue together. It was so funny. I miss his presence. He never said that. He said, really? I mean, yeah, I miss him too, man. It was good. I don't know what happened. We just stopped fighting and got separated. He goes, yeah, that guy said, you know, he missed you. So then they start, he's taking the good news between them, and they become friends again. That is what's permissible. Because you're, you, it's maslaha. You're trying to put hearts together. Right? But unfortunately, most people do the opposite now. You know, they make Bhutan in stories about people. And one thing about Bhutan that people have to be careful because a lot of people in our culture, they're unaware of Bhutan. It's different from lying. It's different. Bhutan is when you make something up that never happened. Right? You say, oh, I went to so and so and he said da 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 about you. you. He never said that. You just made that up. Right? Or you say, hey, oh, I saw your, your daughter in a club. You know, there was a, you know, stuck for Allah. Or I saw your son drinking a beer, right? He never did. So here, here's the, 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 sin, the sinfulness of that is absolutely it's horrible. It's one of the most horrible things a human being can do. And only people whose heart has turned black spiritually and they're completely foul, they do that and filled with hatred. On the day of judgment, Allah will ask you, remember? That story you said that that boy was drinking alcohol. Yeah. Because you can't lie on that day, right? Your tongue will say it. Allah said, okay, what is that? I, I want you to make that happen. Make that a truth. Because certainly it wasn't, I didn't create that. I didn't, it, was, it didn't happen. It wasn't part of the divine plan that manifested. So now what I want you to do is go ahead. You have time. Their judgment is long. And this person is the humiliation of everybody looking and watching and seeing that what they did. Because on the day of judgment, one of the reasons why the day of judgment is 50,000 years, 100,000 years in narration, is because you have to watch the movie of your life. Your entire movie, you have to watch it. And not only that, thousands of people that you know, everybody you, they watch the movie of your life. Everything that you have done, everything that we have done, we will see it in, in better than HD in 4K. Right? Because angels are recording. This is one of the things. And it's not out of hatred. It's out of love. How many pictures of our children we take? How many videos of our kids we have on our phones? Because we love them. Allah has so much love for us that he has angels recording us 24-7. But then how, what do we do in return? Shameful acts. But they're all be on the big screen. And everybody will see it. The prophets will see it. Your teachers will see it. Your parents will see it. Your grandparents will see it. Everything, everybody will see these movies of your life. And then you have to, oh, you made this bukhtan about this person? And the person doesn't know? And they're standing there, I thought you were my friend? Right? The humiliation, just by itself, just by itself. You know, one of the poets said, Shabhoi daraz bi ibadat chikonam. He said, these beautiful long nights, what am I going to do with these nights if I don't worship Allah? I don't worship Allah in these beautiful, those long nights are for, for worship. He said, because my tab, my tabi'a, my nature is just used to, is ha become habitual, like Aristotle said, if you do something, it becomes habitual, right? You do it until it becomes habitual. People who are habitual sinners, I am a sinner by habit. What can I do? And then he said that they say that he is Kareem. This is what I heard. He's Kareem, he's generous. And he forgives sins. That's what Allah is Kareem, he forgives. He said, even if Allah forgives, how am I going to deal with the humiliation on that day? Just everybody watching me and seeing what I've done. And this is one of the things that Sheikh Hamza said that I think it, it was a game changer for me. It was paradigm shift. Like literally, this, this is, if this doesn't change your life, I don't know what will. I don't know what will. Because we are all sinners. Kullu ibn Adam khattaun. Every son and daughter of Adam they make mistakes. They sin. We're not angels. He said that Allah gives you an opportunity 
to edit your own movie of your life. The editing suite is in your hand. You can edit and cut any scene you don't like in your life. And you know, ah, no, I don't want that scene. I don't want anybody to see that, that scene. You can edit it by making Tawbah. Tawbah is the editing suite of the movie of your life. And if you make Toba from something, there were people who I know a person in, in this community who was an alcoholic, and he changed his life. He abandoned alcohol, and he became a person. Every time I would see him, I would go to him. I said, make du'a for me. And, no, 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 I, I, I'm a sinner. You know, you make du'a for me. I said, make du'a for me. Because a, a, a thousand of my du'a is not even one of your du'a. Because I know you edited, you cut it. He hates alcohol. He hates the name of it. He has a hard time going to a liquor store. He can't even walk on the aisle in the grocery store that have alcohol. Because he made sincere toba. So on the day of judgment, nobody will see his drinking. Because he made toba. Sincere toba to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what they're trying to teach us in this. So if you make up a story, you have to make that come true on that day. So, yeah, so a, a lie that is, that is, there's benefit in it is better than this truth that has, so he says, people of kharat, people of knowledge and intellect and wisdom, they have said, this is again another proverb from the Gulistan of Saudi. He said that a lie that has benefit is better than a truth that has fitna that brings fitna in the community. All right? So you have to be careful. And then he has a poem. Har kisha on konad ke uguyad, heif boshad ke juz nikuguyad. Whoever is in that position, and there are people, this is the position of not just the king. Again, the position of being near your father, right? The, the, the one that's close to the father and their siblings. And then you, you want to you wanna say good things about them. Right, the person who is in a company, you're close to the CEO. The person who works at the at the masjid, right? And then they have people. So if you're close to the one who makes the decision maker, right? If you're close to the king, he said, he said, it would be very unfortunate if they speak anything that other than beauty. They should they should just speak beautifully, and say beautiful things, and elevate people, and not put people down. So then he has Bartaka Iwan Fredun Nabishtabud. And the talk is in is and uh Fredun was the great king of Persia. A lot of people think that my father named me after that, because a lot of the Freyduns in Persia they're named after him, but he didn't name me after the king. He named me after uh, Freydun Mushiri, who was one of the last great poets of, of Iran. Uh one of my favorite poets. Uh so he named me after him. Uh this this beautiful poet. He, he died, I think, maybe 20 years ago, so 20 some years ago. Uh, anyways, um, so he said, it's written on this king's palace. Jahan Eibara dar namanat bakas, delan dar jahan afrin band bas. So Jahan, this world, oh my brother, is not going to remain for anyone. In other words, one of the things that... Uh, the great master uh, of spirituality of Balkh. Uh, he was a prince of Balkh. And he uh, he let go and went on the path of asceticism. We talked about it, about his story. Uh, and he he got to this place, and this man was living in this really a big mansion. And they said, wow, whose house is it? He goes, it's my, uh, he said, uh, he said uh, whose caravan sarai is this? Caravan sarai used to be like the hotels back then. We used to go and spend the night and then travel and go to the next destination. So they didn't have the hotel system like we have now. They had the zawiyas for the spiritual path, uh, and then they had the, the caravans ride. I said, who caravans ride? I said, what, are you stupid or something? This is, this is our house. I said, really? Who lived here before? He goes, uh, before that, my grandfather used to live here. Said, what happened? He goes, he died, and we're living here. Said, what about before that? He goes, my grandfather bought it from the head of the Kabila. He sold it. He used to live here. He said, what happened? He said, yeah, then he died and he left. So he said, 
So he said, I'm telling you, it's a caravan's ride. Everybody come spend a few days here and then they leave. <laughs> so that's the reality of the world. So he is saying, oh, my brother, this world has no wafa. It's not, nobody can take anything with them, right? You only go with your shroud of death. Dilandar Jahan Ofarin Bandabas. Connect your heart to the one who has created the Jahan, the world, in bus. Period. That's it. So instead of putting putting the dunya in your heart, no, this you can't put the dunya in your heart. Put the creator of the dunya in your heart. Makun takia bar molki dunya wa pushed, kebisyor kas jun tu parwar to kushed. Don't lean in this world, right? The world was just this one, ah, to chill, you have a long time. It's all right, just enjoy your life, do as thou wealth, right? This is the new Alistair Crowley and the, the Crowley out in, 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 you know, like what like Jay-Z has, the, the t-shirt, do as thou wealth, do whatever you want. You know, you only live once. Yeah, you live, live once, but it should be a life of meaning. But this is not the life. You know, out of the five lives that we have, this is the shortest life. Of all the five lives, we have the, the pre-creation, the pre-world, which is we were souls. In front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created our souls. That's one life. That's a long life. We were there. Allah knows millennia, right? And then we had the, the, life of, uh, uh, the life of the junior, right? And then we have the life of the barzakh. That when we die, we go into the grave and there's a life in the barzakh. People, you know, Adam alayhi salam has been in the barzakh. Since then, all of the... the the, his children have been in the barzakh till now, right? Whoever dies, we go in the barzakh. It's an interspace between this world and the next. And then the day of judgment, 50,000 years, 100,000 years, just a day of judgment, right? That's another life. And then the, the next life, the, the final about paradise, inshallah, for all of us, or those who need to be purified in the fire, right? So all this dunya is as short as 60, 70 years, right? That's what the Prophet ﷺ said. The, the average of my ummah is between 60 to 70 years. So can you live 100 years? It still is nothing. So he's saying, don't lean in this world because it's, it's, not, it's not long. It, this is not long. You know, Saadi talked about the first session, if you remember. He said, don't lean in the dunya because it has no pillar. Because it just fall. But don't, you always have to be vigilant. And one thing about animals, they're always vigilant. Right? This is a... Shaqiq al balkhi they, he, he, uh, they ask him, he said, how did you learn muraqiba? Like, so he was mentioning one of his teachers. Said, they said that the, the people of spirituality, most of them, they learn muraqiba from cats. And muraqiba is like to be just instead of awareness. On, you know, your focus is one. And that focus is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obviously, right? But he said, they, we learned, he said, I learned it from a cat. He said, how do you learn muraqiba from a cat? He said, there was a mouse hole, and I saw a cat waiting for the mouse to come out and just, and just take the mouse. He said, this cat, the eyes will not swirl, focus on this, and ready to attack the moment. I said, if a cat can do that for a mouse, I can't do that for Allah. I can't have muraqibah. And that's how they came. And everything is an example in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, don't, don't just chill and relax in the world. Because this world has given, has brought, you know, has given, you know, raised so many people like you before and killed so many people and, and ate it. This is the nature of the world. It raised, you know, you get raised in this world, you eat the fruit of the world. You know, the, the, the food of the world, the water, all of these stuff. And then, okay, get, and then raise you, and then boom. And then it kills you, and then it eats you back. So he says, this is the nature of this dunya. When it's time for you to go, the melody of death comes. It's a beautiful word. The melody of death comes. He said, does it matter if you die on the, on the concrete or on the dirt or on the or on a five-star bed. You're going to die, you're going to die. It wouldn't make a difference. So don't be deluded by the things of this world. All right. Now, these stories generally, the way I, because it's the live stream is, is on the other side of the, the, the U.S., um, generally I get the feedback from the attendees. 
to see what they think. But we'll, we'll, we'll continue. So if anybody has feedback on these, they can, they can send an email to me, inshallah. And I would love to uh, look at it and see your take on these. So again, uh, advice to the kings, to the leaders, to the head of the household, all of them, you can apply these teachings. So we'll go to, uh, um, I just want to be on time. I think we can finish this. I'll do one more. Uh, he says, uh, again, we are in Bob Awal, first Bob, and Sirat of on the uh, characteristics of the kings, Hekaya number 12. So he says, Yaki has muluk be in soft. One of the muluk be in soft is, is uh, what he's talking about is a king, a leader that is oppressor. He's an oppressive king that, that, that is doing zulum. That is doing uh, that oppressing his people. Parsa is is a zahir, someone who is a person, a man of Allah, someone who is detached from the dunya and connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As ibadat ha kudam fazil tarast, he said, which of the ibadah of worship Allah is, has the most preference with Allah? Like, what is the best ibadah I could do amongst all of the ibadahs, all of the worship? So, this, this king. Who is a, a volume, an oppressor, horrible king? He is asking which is the best ibadah for him to do from this zahid. Goft, he replied, Tura khab nimruz to daran yag nafas khalqra nayazul. He said, For you, the best worship is qaydula, you know, this afternoon nap, you know, sunnah to do an afternoon nap. You don't have to do it, it's really, it's just. He said, so people are free from your oppression for a few minutes when you're sleeping. <laughs> and there are some people, you know, it's like, man, I wish you would sleep more, right? Because when they're awake, they're just wreak havoc on the world. So in any case, so this is an, his, uh, his uh, trying to teach us now a malik that is, that is an oppressor, that's a bad malik. You know, how do you deal with that? Zalimira khufta didam nimruz guftam in fitnas. He said, I saw a zalim, a, a person, of, an oppressor, uh, and he was sleeping in the, in the early afternoon because it's sunnah to sleep out in the early afternoon after dhuhr. It's a sleep, it's called qaydula, and it's sunnah to do it. It's actually very healthy. They actually did a study uh, that uh, an afternoon nap, uh, even as short as uh, 30 to 45 minutes, it actually is good for your health. Obviously, we don't need that to know because our Prophet Sallallahu everything that he did, there's wisdom in it as well. You get the reward of Sunnah and you get the benefit of good health. If you can. He said, I saw this oppressor sleeping in the middle of the day. I said, this man is a man of fitna, of trials and tribulation. It's better that he keeps sleeping. Oh, to the one whose sleep is better than the state of awakening. The one whose sleep is better than his awakened state. A life like that, a bad life like that, is better to, to be dead than to be alive. Right? So, so the poets, they say that there's, there's the two people that they, they say that death is better than their life. One is the one who's an oppressor. Because they, when they're alive, they just keep oppressing people. And the other one, uh, uh, those people who have no benefit for themselves and for others. Like they just have no benefit for anybody. For anybody. He said, if, if, uh, uh, right? A tree that is dead, barren, and dry, with no leaf, nothing. He said it's better to use that for firewood. You know, at least you can use it and start a fire and cook something with it than have this tree that is dead, ugly, there's, there's no benefit in it. And people like that tree, he's saying that. Yeah. It's not a curse, uh, but it's a thing. This is another nice one. I like it. It's, a, it's still the first chapter, Hekaya number uh, 29. One of the wazara, one of the, the wazirs, the minister, went to Zunun al-Misri, who was a, uh, a spiritual master, a scholar, and, and a man of the heart, and a wise man. And he asked for advice. That's what Muhammad means here. Uh, 
that he said that, listen, uh, day and night, I'm busy with the khidmah of the sultan, of the king. He's a wazir, he's a minister, he's a right-hand man of the sultan. He said, day and night, I'm, I'm just occupied with, with the service of the sultan. And I have always hoped that he would give me good, that he would, you know, good would come out from him to me, and he would do good, and everything that's good that, that, that would happen from the king. Was tarsan. Aquba means that when you get punished for a sin, right? If you do something wrong and they punish you, that's aqubat. So, and then he said that I'm afraid that he might, if I make a mistake, he will punish me for my sin, for my disobedience. Well, I just fear that a lot. But I'm hopeful always that he would show goodness and, and beauty. Zunun begiris to go. Zunun and misri, this wise man, start crying. And he said, اگر من خدای را عز و جل چنین پرستیدمی که تو سلطان را از جمله صدیقان می‌دانی. If I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that you are serving your sultan, I would be amongst the siddiqs, amongst the elite of the world. And this is one thing that people really need to take into consideration. Sometimes we actually do more for people than we do for Allah. Like literally people do, they have more fear of their boss than they have of Allah. They have more hope in, in, uh, in science than they have in healing from Allah. The, our first thing, the first door that we go, because Allah has closed all the doors. There's only one door that's open, the door of Allah. You go to Allah and after that, everything else that you do, if you're sick, when you go to the doctor, you know that he's a, he's a, that's a sabab. Allah is the one who heals. Allah has, you have to go to this doctor. It's part of the, how Allah created it. But you have to believe that this, this is from Allah. The medicine when you take for healing, that medicine, Allah is putting the healing in the medicine. He can heal you without the medicine as well. But the sunnah of Allah is that you have to use the asbab. You have to use the asbab. This is the, this is the way he made the world. Right? But he can heal you with that medicine. Simple as that. He can do that. But he says, no. Take the medicine. I'll heal you through that medicine. This is how Allah created. We don't believe medicine heals. Part of our aqidah. You, you, you can't say, oh, I have a headache. Tylenol is going to fix me. Tylenol is going to fix me. Iznillah. Allah is going to fix through this Tylenol. He is the one who heals. And he put the healing in that. Right? So he said, I will be amongst the Siddiq if I worship Allah the way you are honoring your king. Now, Siddiq is, why didn't he use Abi a Wali, right? Why Siddiq? Why not a martyr, a shaheed, a Wali? There's four categories of people the Quran mentions, right? And that's the four categories. Allah says, be amongst these four categories. Like if you you know, love them, try to be them. There's one that you can't, it's closed already, the door. So, minan nabiyina was siddiqina was shuhadai was salihin. Amongst the who? It, this is about the day of judgment. Be amongst with the prophets. We would like to be around the prophets. We can't be prophets, right? But we should strive to be with the prophets, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and other prophets. And then siddiqin, the truthful. That's why Abu Bakr, a siddiq, has the highest maqam. Khayr al khalqillah. He is the best of Allah's creation after the prophets. Abu Bakr Siddiq. He is the best of Allah. He is a Siddiq. He is the highest maqam. Right? Now, Umar ibn Khattab is a shaheed. He is a shaheed of mihrab. He is a martyr of the mihrab. Everybody, salihin are the righteous people. So a Nabi, a Nabi, a prophet, has a Siddiq inside of him has a shaheed inside of him, and has a salih inside of him. So all of those are in a nabi. A nabi is a siddiq, is a shaheed, is a salih. All of them. A siddiq has a rank of a shaheed and a salih. And a shaheed has a rank of a salih as well. But a salih is not a shaheed. A salih is not a siddiq. Got it? So that's, in, in a, and a siddiq is not a prophet. Right? So he said, I'll be amongst the siddiq because those are the people who have the highest maqam with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so 
گرنه امید و بیم و راحت و رنج پای درویش بر فلک بودی و وزیر از خدا بترسیدی همچنان که از ملک همچنان که از ملک ملک بودی so the first one is ملک the second one is ملک what is with the kasra one is the second one is with the fatha ملک uh, means the, the king ملک means the angel so he said if the wazir had the same feeling towards Allah as he had towards the king he would become an angel he would become an angel okay so um, we'll do one more it's 3.55 and we'll close uh, sorry maybe we can finish this on the next session the next one so the next one is a bab of darwishan in the akhlaq of darwish the reason why he does that he starts with the kings then he goes to the citizens the relationship between the two the powerful and the powerless how to deal with each other یکی از بزرگان گفت پارسای را one of the, the, the people of the head of the tribes a learned man he went to a parsa a zahid he went to him a person who was detached from the world he said چی گویی در حق فلان آبد که دیگران در حق وی به تعنه سخنها گفتن what do you say about this worshiper this ordinary worshiper like us about him so he says فلان which means so and so about so and so that people are saying really bad things about him what do you say about him he said گفت بر ظاهرش عیب نمی بینم و در باطنش غیب نمی دانم he said I don't see any deficiency in his outward and I don't know anything about his inward I can't see I can't see his heart Allah has Allah has told us to judge people by the outward not by the inward because we don't know the state of the inward if somebody is a monafiq but they're praying in the masjid we should just assume they're good people and they're praying in the masjid right always have husn of dhan have good opinion of people you know a lot of people say oh he's not a muslim why is that a muslim well this is white or he's black is that the criteria now that we can say everybody that you meet they should just you should just think they're they're muslim honestly you should I mean, I, I I was shocked to see some people, and and one of the we one of the guys we at the at the store, some Muslim guys. It's a true story, though. And, and just trying on the night of Ramadan, he was trying to flirt with this girl in a Muslim in a in a, in a suit store, trying to buy a suit, and beautiful white American girl, and blonde eyes, blue hair, and he's he was doing that, and so anyways. And then uh, there's a conversation between him and his friend. He goes, "Man, isn't isn't tomorrow Ramadan?" And like, and and then the girl says, "Are you guys Muslim?" And and, and he says, "Yes, uh, yeah, we are." He goes, is, is, "When is Ramadan? Is it tomorrow or the day after?" And they say, "It's tomorrow." It's, oh, Subhanallah! I'm looking forward, Mashallah, for Ram. And the guy's like, "Wait a second, you Muslim?" He goes, "Yeah, I'm from Bosnia." And she was like, her Arabic was sort of. <laughs> Just so you think that you should always assume people are Muslim unless they they tell you they're not a Muslim. So this is a, a really, you know, we have, should have good opinion of people. So he's saying, I have a good opinion of his outward because I didn't see anything wrong with it. And I can't see his inward. Allah is not allowing us to see the inward of the people. We are not judging by the inward. <laughs> In car, in car. So he says, whoever has the clothing of of a of a zahid. In other words, their outward looks good. Just assume that they're good, and that's it. Don't. War not only that they are not on a cheese, but they are not on a cheese. And you don't know what's inside of it. And this motasib is a very beautiful word in in uh, in Arabic and Persian. Motasib is is a person who is the religious police, especially in Ramadan they have it. it traditionally, in the Muslim country, they would go make sure people are fasting and they don't eat in, uh, on the streets, right? So, but he says a motasib, the religious police, he has no ruling inside your house. So if you if you're not fasting inside your house, the religious police cannot come in into your house. They don't have the right. It's your private. That's protected. So he's saying that this is the house of a man inside their heart. Leave them to Allah. 
Allah will judge on that, that day. He didn't ask us to judge them. And khalas, just go by the outward. And one of the things with, with, uh, with this society is that a lot of the things that needs to be in the house is becoming public domain now. That Those things that are in the house, is it's like, you know, in, in this language, in this culture, they have a proverb that says, don't bring out your dirty laundry out in front of others, right? Don't bring your dirty laundry. Don't talk about stuff that is supposed to be in the house. One of the scary hadith is about the, the, the Prophet ﷺ telling the Sahaba that don't, you know, shouldn't fornicate on the street corner. Like on the, and they, they were like, how could somebody do that? He said, if you talk about what you did in the bedroom on the street, it's as though you have done it. Right? This whole concept of sexuality remains in the bedroom and it doesn't come out. Whatever people do, in their bedroom is nobody's business, but they shouldn't bring it out. Now, unfortunately, it's a culture that everybody, whatever, ha they have to come out and proclaim that. And all these young Muslim youth, they're confused. They think that this is the norm. That's not the norm. It wasn't like that. When I went to high school, you couldn't talk about these stuff because if you did, you would be, you'd be attacked. You'd be beaten up, right? So, but it's, it has changed over the past 20, you know, quarter of a century. Things are a lot, a lot of the stuff has changed. But for Muslims, we shouldn't even be talking about these things. If somebody wants to talk about it, say, listen, whatever, whatever you are, whatever you do, it's between you and your Lord and yourself. I, you know, hey, I don't want to talk about it. So those are the things, that's just what he's saying, that we should just judge by the outward and not by the inward. And inshallah, it's 401, and we respect the time. There's a, a couple more in here in, uh, in the last page. I will do this, inshallah, next time. This is actually one of my favorite ones, the, the, the Sufi Sheikh and the Thief uh, story. So we'll do that next time, and inshallah we'll do uh, uh, a couple of other, from diff another chap from the other chapters. There's, there's, there's different chapters in the Gulistan as we talked about, and we will try to do at least like one from each chapter, so you get a taste of what Saadi is talking about, what is his advice. So he's, then the, next, the chapter on love is really amazing, um, you know, uh, old age love, which uh, what we call, in this culture, they call it midlife crisis, uh, which actually is a bad name. It should be end of life crisis because people ruin their life. Uh, you know, I, I, I know somebody in our community that came in. Um, I said, where's uncle, you know, so-and-so. And, I mean, he's pretty old because I call him uncle and I'm pretty old, you know. <laughs> so he said, oh, uncle left and he got married and He's wearing shorts and on the beach in this country, and da, da da da. I'm like, Uncle has grandchildren, doesn't he? Yeah, the grandchildren are in high school. I'm like, Uncle is in his late 60s at least, right? He goes, yeah, but I don't know. It's mid midlife crisis. Said, that ain't no midlife crisis. That's end of life crisis. Like, how long do you expect to live, right? So if you know the thing with 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 with, with these. Uh, unfortunately, with the, this culture, you, you're never safe, right? It's, it's always like people can, you, you can don't don't ever don't ever say, oh, I'm not gonna, nothing's going to happen to me. I'm fine. My iman is strong, and that's those are the people that would lose it. All of those people say, no, no, nothing. They're so arrogant about it. Just be humble. Say, you know, Allah help me. Allah, you know, inshallah, I'm doing my best, and try to stay away from people that would take you. The worst thing in life. Young, for the young people, I know there's a lot of youngster with Miftah. The worst thing in your life is number one is your friends. Either the best or the worst. Your friend can take you to hell or literally be a partner to take you out of the hell and put you in paradise. If you have good friends. If you have bad friends, you are a bad, but tarbuat as more bad. You know? Maulana's, you know, that, that a, a bad friend is worse than a poisonous snake. And that's the reality of it, because a poisonous snake, obviously, it hurts your body. But he said the bad friend, it hurts your body and your faith and your, your religion. So, Al Maru al Adini Khalili, the Prophet said a person is in the religion of his friend. So, that's number one thing. 
And number two is this, is these gadgets. If you can control this, don't let it control you. If you can control this, you're a successful person. You're amongst the, the people of Sa'ada. But if it's controlling you, it's kind of like, you know, the person they say that Mi barat har su ke khahat asp khabaludara. They said that the, the horse takes in any direction it wants the sleepy rider. If you're a sleepy rider, it's the horse that takes you in directions. But if you're a vigilant rider, it's you that's controlling the horse. If you can control this horse, then you're in good shape, you know, where it's not controlling you. Uh, other than that, I think, you know, inshallah, it will be fine. But those, those are the two main things. And inshallah, these lessons are just for life. Reflect on them. See what it means to you, what it means in your life, what it means in your mosque, what it means in your household, what it means in your society. Most of the problems of the Muslim world, this Gulistan of Saadi used to be on the table for every president in France as a gift when they took office after Saadi Karma. They had that for 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 century. That's that was a gift. Everyone who came in, they had to read the Gulistan, the, the, the chapter. Not only just the chapter on the king, but the chapter on the Darwish as well, on the on the citizen and on the poor people uh, of the country. And that's why they use this. And then we have another way. We have John Stuart Mills. We have other style of governing, you know, the uh, uh, Machiavelli style as well. And we have we are seeing that this is the you know is what uh, Bashar al Assad is doing in in Syria. That, that, that that's another style. They pick up those style. They don't pick up this. This style of, of teaching, which is founded in wisdom and mercy. In wisdom and mercy. And this is one of the stories <coughs> in the Gulistan. And we'll end. He talks about a, uh, Anushirwan Adil. Anushirwan was one of the, the kings of Persia. And he was, he was famous for the Adil, for the just king. He said that one day he went uh, hunting. And they, they hunted a, a, a deer. And they brought it, they slaughtered it, and they barbecued it. As they were grilling it, and they said they realized they didn't bring any salt. And food without salt, there's no taste in it, right? You have to have salt. So Anushirwan sent uh, one of the, the, the commander told his one of the soldiers to go get some salt from the from one of the stores in this in the in the city. So he was getting on his horse to go get salt. Anushirwan called him and he said, Make sure that you pay for the salt when you when you get it from the store. And the soldier said, oh, my master, oh, the king. What is it? What is a little bit of salt that I take from them and bring for the king if I don't pay for it? And he said, the foundation, and Shirwan tells the soldier, and it's a beautiful example, and you would see how, and just look at Pakistan, look at Afghanistan, uh, look at uh, all of the Muslim countries, just look at them, and you would see that how true this example is. He said, all oppressions start very small. And they keep building, and they keep building, and they keep building. He said, if Saadi then comes in, he goes, Saadi says, if a soldier of Anushirwan gets an egg from a store, the lieutenant will get the chicken, and then the commander will get the lamb. And then he, go, he said, by the time he gets to the commander in chief, he will take the entire village apart and take everybody's wealth, food, and everything. But it all starts with salt. Just a little bit worthless salt, right? So he says, no, pay for it. So we don't we don't put the foundation or break of oppression. We don't want to put that. And unfortunately, in many of our countries, not the foundational is there, but the walls have been built and the castles have been built. And 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 take and reversing this is only one way. It's only one way. It's through ilm. It's through knowledge. It's through education. And people, once they come, see, this book was taught in, in a lot of the Muslim countries, non-Muslim countries, Hindu, Sikhs. The, I met Sikhs that have more Gulistan memorized than I do. Literally, they have, when they were like five, six years old, they memorized it. So there are people, and they implement it in their lives. So if we implement these things, we can change, we can bring a revolution of akhlaq, of character. That's what's needed. There's too many revolutions around the world. Every Muslim, everywhere you go is destroyed. Like you can't, we don't even have a vacation spot for Muslims. Everywhere you go is like, you know, you want to go and you want to see. It's just, we need a, you know, Iqbal said, 
ای سے تیرے خودی میں اگر انقلاب ہو پیدا عجب نہیں ہے کہ یہ چار سو بدل جائے that if there is a revolution within yourself if there is an internal revolution the revolution of the heart an ethical revolution it is then that your surrounding will change you can't change your surrounding by force but you can change it with love Raghav al-Sfahani said if love exists amongst people then who needs justice you really don't need justice if there's love we justice is needed in absence of love and we're living in a society that there's no love people have no love their most support goes to pakistan and afghanistan from immigrants who live in america and in uk and in europe than the people there and those people are much wealthier than the people who are sending from here much wealthier they have more money but they don't help their own people. They see them suffer, they don't care. And that's what we need to change. We need to have a internal revolution of the heart, a revolution, an ethical revolution that we change and bring these teachings to life and we will see within a generation we can change our societies, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Next week is the last session, inshallah, and we will close this chapter on the Gulistan. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أعوذ بكلمات الله تامات من شر ما خلق صلى الله تعالى على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين برحمة الله الرحمن الرحيم first of all apologies for being late one of the things that سيد حسين ناصر said that he said I would like to be a Muslim in every way except being late because it's becoming like the culture of the Muslims to always be late. But our Prophet ﷺ was the most uh, on-time person in, uh, in a tradition that he was never late for an appointment. And uh, he always honored time because time is sacred and it's from Allah. And Allah swears by time because um, Allah doesn't swear by anything insignificant. So, wal asri inna insana lafi khusr. I swear by this time of asr. Allah swears by that. But wal fajr wal yalin ashr by the time of fajr. So Allah swears by the time Dahar, uh, because it's, it's, it's sacred. Allah is the creator of time, and we are stuck in time and space, so we should honor that. Uh, but I do apologize for being late. Jazakallah khair for your patience. Inshallah, today is the last class of the four-week course on the uh, Gulistan of uh, Saadi Shirazi. One of the things about the poets that uh, separates them from everybody else is that the foundation of Islamic uh, teachings is uh, what we call the akhlaq or the ethics of Islamic teachings is adab. And without adab, there is nothing in our civilization. i give you an example. If someone has a lot of money and they have, you know, they're very wealthy and they even give charity without adab, nobody appreciates it. So if they just throw it in your face, here you go, here's $100,000 for your masjid, just throw. There's no other in it, so that money has no value. If you give a gift to someone without any other, right, even if it's an expensive gift and you throw it at them without other, it has no value, right? This is why the, the person, they say, that even a, a, a leaf of a tree, which is the, wor the most worthless things on the planet, because they just keep falling, right? Everywhere there's leaves of tree. If you give it with adab, like a darwish would give, it has more value than, you know, if somebody gives gold without adab. So knowledge, what is the foundation of knowledge? So there's a prerequisite in every science. There's a prerequisite. So you can't go get calculus if you didn't have pre-calculus, right? You can't get algebra if you don't have. So all of these sciences that we study, like English class when you go to college, uh, we, I have a classmate of mine with college together here. With the college, they, they, you do a test. And then they, if your English is good, they give you the, the English 1A. If it, it's not good, they give you the, well, when we were back in college, you said uh, 100 R, which was like the writing, and 100 W was the, the, you know, the writing in the reading classes. So those were the classes you have to take the, in order to get to English 1A. And then, so you're ready for it. So knowledge in itself, this, this, this ilm that, that Allah is talking about in the Quran, in our Prophet ﷺ presenting to us, 
has a prerequisite to it. And the prerequisite of learning is adab. You have to have adab. Adab, in reality, the meaning of adab, obviously, it means comportment. It means, but the reality of it is to put things in their proper places. That's what adab is. So there's adab of dressing, right? So, uh, you know, it, everything goes in its place. So you, you put the ring, you know, the, the, the sunnah fingers, you know, these are the sunnah fingers, right, that the Prophet ﷺ put the rings. So you don't put the ring, you know, some people put it in, and it's just, it's lack of adab. Like literally, he was an adib. The Prophet ﷺ said that he has perfected that level of adab. And he says, Adabani Rabbi fa ahsana ta'adibi. Allah has taught me adab and how beautiful he has taught it to me. So he learned adab from Allah. Allah taught him how to be because this is, he is the best exemplar that Allah put on earth so we can emulate him, right? So he's a, he, this is the pinnacle of, of, of adab that he's, that he's embodying in his action, in his words. So what separates the poets from everybody else is that they have adab with words. So they put words in their proper places. I'll give you an example. If I tell you a line in prose, right, because there's like, if you, if you get like people who are interested in, in Farsi, you can get uh, uh, the, the Masnavi of Rumi commentary by Gul Pinarli, the, the great uh, Turkish uh, scholar. So what he did, he put the, he put the poem, the actual Persian Farsi poem, and then he put a nasr, he put the, the poem in a line, just like in, in prose. So what it means, because a lot of people, they read the line and they can't really understand it fully, so then he put it like just in regular Farsi, like in, in, uh, in prose. And then he did uh, sharh on it. But if you read the line first, it doesn't affect you. When you read the poem, it affects you. Why is that? Because the line is there just it's kind of like, it's like two buildings you look at. One is a building that was built just for purpose built for, let's say, dormitory or for uh, an apartment complex where they say, how can we make a building where a lot of people can fit in there in the least amount of space, right? Then you look at another building that they built it. How could we make this a beautiful building or that architecture is alive in this building? So when you look at this building, you're like, Oh my, you're awestruck. When you look at the other building, like, mm, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a building, another building you pass by. You, it doesn't even attract your eyes to look at it a second time. But a beautiful building, you keep looking and you stop and you want to take a photo because it's amazing. The same thing with poetry. Poetry is like the, they're like architecture, like actual poets, like architect, that they, they beautify words. Because they put it in, in, in beautiful places. So one of the things that the poet said, he said, look at your face. He said, look at your face. If you take the eyebrows from there and put it below the eyes, you will be ugly. It's perfect where is it at. Allah has designed everything. It's, it's like the adab of the face. How everything is exactly where they're supposed to be. Right? The eyes, the nose, the teeth, the lips, the... Everything in the human body is exactly where it's supposed to be. And that's, a, it's, it's, you know, that's where we have the potential to become ad, people of adab outwardly and inwardly. So they have adab with words, and that's what affects people. And this is one of the uh, things that in our tradition, poetry was at the foundation of teachings. I don't remember having a class with one of our teachers, Dr. Barakatullah, Hafizullah, with you know, we studied under him. The, every class, there was a line of poetry or something that we, or a proverb that he would bring up. And the thing with poetry and proverb is that it explains something so complex in a very simple way. You have Urdu proverb, English proverb, Persian, Arabic. Every language have proverbs. But proverbs, they come from poetry. It's the, the Gulistan of Saadi is filled with proverbs. But they're all poetry in motion. It's words in motion that becomes poetry. So we will finish today inshallah um, going over a few uh, more of the stories from the Gulistan of Saadi, a book of real masterpiece of Persian literature. It is
probably one of the greatest books that was ever written in the history of, of literature, not just Persian. Uh, the likes of it is impossible to find uh, in, within the Persian literature uh, either because nobody could, everybody kind of like salute the Gulistan. It's, like it's, it's a book in, in a category of itself. Uh, there was a lot of copycat that came. There's a lot of people that try to imitate it. Uh, nobody can imitate this this style uh, because he was such he was such a genius. And he was, uh, as we mentioned in the first session, what he went through in life, the, the the thirty plus years of traveling and being in the dungeon of 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 the you know during the Crusaders and and just all of the life experience. Because one of the things that Maulana Rumi says is that. If you look at the nay, which is the, the symbolism for insan al camel in the Masnavi, uh, the, the flute, he said, if you look at the nay, because he started his book, Rumi started his book with the nay, like Bishna was nay, chun hikayat me, and I'd listen to the reed bed, the, the flute is telling his story. He said, the reason why it sounds really good, there are a few things, and you know, uh, the scholars have talked about this, but I, I I was fascinated by the Ney for many, many years, and, and I've been doing a lot of research on the Ney. Like, what's, why would he use the Ney? Why not a guitar? Why not something else? Why the Ney as a symbolism for himself, for Rumi, that he's saying he is the Ney? There are a few aspects to the Ney. One is the outward of the Ney. If you look at the Ney, uh, Abdul Qadir Bedil, the great poet of India, said, As tarkibar Ney banna maqami nawarasi. He said, the reason why Nay reached this maqam, this high station of, of singing these beautiful tunes is because it abandons the leaves. What are the leaves? It's called ta'alluqat, right? These are attachment that on the path of spirituality, you have to detach yourself from the things of this world. So a Nay detaches itself from the leaves. So they, it's smooth on the outside. Then... It's everything that's inside of the Nay, they take it out, right? Everything, it becomes hollow from the inside. And those are what we call spiritual diseases of the heart, like kibber and, you know, what we call arrogance and envy and uh, sim'at and all of these diseases of the heart, spiritual diseases of the heart, they take these out of the Nay. So it becomes empty from the inside, from everything that is other than Allah. In that and then that's not done. See, a lot of people go through the first step. They go, I'm a Zahid. I don't have any attachment to the world. But filthy inside. They backbite. They think they're better than other people. Oh, I'm a Zahid. I'm better than other people. I get up for night prayer. I'm better than other people. And this is in this story that we're not going to cover because it's, it's just a lot of, there's a lot to cover in this book. In the story, Sa'adi mentions about, uh, a, you know, a man who gets up of, for Fajr prayer. And then there are people who are sleeping, and he prays, and then in the morning he said, oh, these people were sleeping while I got up, and did my fajr, and made the dua, and did the tahajr. He just goes on about his ibadah, and look at these guys, they were all sleeping in, uh, in the city of Ghifla, and forgot about God. And then Sa'di said, I wish you would have slept, and not prayed fajr, and then to get up, and then look down upon everybody, that it gives you arrogance, that you're better than anybody. And then you're backbiting the whole day, collecting sins and seeing people as, as lower than yourself. So your sleep would have been better than your prayer as a prayer of arrogance, a prayer of, of just showing off, a prayer that I'm better than other people. So one of the things they do is that but it, you have to do a, the detach from outside and then the hollowness from the inside. But one of the most important things that a lot of people don't talk about is, is still... The nay is not going to sound. There's no sound will come out of it until you have the holes. You have to have the holes in the nay, in the flute. So once you, and that is what we call the experience of life. The experience of life will, will mold you into something amazing if you see what's coming. If you see what's coming. If you see what Allah is doing with you, and some people, they don't, you know, Rumi said, Garbahar, Zahme, Tupur, Tineshevi, Paskujo, be Seigalo, Ineshevi. And if you get irritated with every rub, how do you expect to be polished and turn into this beautiful, perfect mirror, right? So that's what destiny does. 
And if you're patient with it, and if you learn the lesson from this, the point of all of the trials and tribulation in life is to learn the lesson. If you don't learn the lesson, you will, you will repeat the same, the same thing will come over and over again until you learn the lesson. That is all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you have to submit. So, that's the nay is the experience of life. And, and Sa'adi did that all his life. And then when he came back to Shiraz about 32 or 34 years after he left when he was a teenager, that's when these poems just came out of him. And, and it was ripe. Outside was beautiful like the nay. Inside was hollow like the nay. And he had the holes of the experience of life. And that's when it came out and it's so beautiful. So that's very important to know that, that these things, um, it takes time. Um, when, when the Masnavi of Rumi, the first chapter he wrote, the second chapter, there was a long delay between because, you know, he, uh, there, there was death in the family and also uh, 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 one of his students passed away as well, but I hear. So there was, a, there was two tragedies in, it, in, his, in his life. Uh, and one of the things that when he starts the second chapter, he says, Muddati in Masnavi ta'khir shod. Muhlati boys ta'khun shir shod. This Masnavi, it delayed for a period of time. You need time in order for the, for the blood to turn into milk. And that's what happened. When a woman gets pregnant, it's, it, it, they start having milk, right? But it takes time. In the pain of pregnancy, they have to go through uh, in the pain of childbirth. So he said, Until you don't give birth to this child, the spiritual child of yours. In other words, you don't go through this hardship of life, these difficulties, these moments, this, the night, the sleepless nights, and travels, and whatever you have to do. He said, the blood will not turn into milk. So there are difficulties in learning knowledge. There are difficulties in, in, in getting these maqams in the station of spirituality. This is not fast food nation where you can go and say, hey, can I get my burger with extra cheese on top and it comes within 30 seconds. No, this is like when you, are, when you want real food, it takes a whole day to prepare the real food. Sometimes two days, you have to get this stuff, you have to marinate it. But that's a different food than, the, the, than a burger. But now is everybody wants fast food spirituality and fast food knowledge. You know, six months course, become an island. And I'm like, man, what was that when I was young? Okay, so we will do... Uh, Uh, we couldn't do this, uh, the last two. I don't know if you guys have it or not, but there was a, the last week they only printed one page. It was three pages. But if you don't, I'm going to read it out loud. Out loud. So this is about, it's still in, in, in the, uh, chapter two of the Gulistan on the Bab of the uh, Darwish, Dar uh, Akhlaq Darwishan, and the characteristics and the character of and ethics of the Darwish. And Darwish is the people that we call it the people of the door. Uh, they're the people who are who have no attachment to the dunya, no attachment to the world. They, they don't have anything of the world, and they don't want anything of the world. They just they're the people just busy with themselves and their Lord. They're just busy purifying themselves and going through the 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 uh, all the the things that they need to do um, in order to get closer to Allah and busy with their worship. So it says, "Dosde bakhane parsay daramat." Parsa means a Zahid. We've talked about it. It means someone who is detached from the word in Persian. Zahid is obviously a more universal term that used in Arabic and Persian and Urdu. But Parsa is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a Farsi word. Dozde, Dozd is a thief. Khana obviously is a, is a, is a house. Uh, and Parsa is a Zahid. So a, a Dozd, a thief, and goes into the house of a Zahid. This man who is detached from the world. Chandan ke just cheesy nayaf. No matter how much he searched around the house, he couldn't find anything. In other words, uh, there was nothing worthy of stealing from the house. <laughs> like he goes and he looks everywhere, and there's nothing, you know. And thief has worked very hard. And you have to understand, people who steal, they don't just walk into somebody's house to steal. They do their research, they're watching who has what, what, and then they have to find out a way, how am I going to enter, which wall am I going to So they really 
they put effort into their, their, their wrong action, but there's effort put into that. Like it's just not a random guy just walks in and, and steals. No, they actually calculate everything. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of movies, like the Western movies, that, that actually show that, like how, uh, I don't know if people are a fan of uh, Avengers, but like the Ant Man uh, movie, how he, like before he steals something, he has all of the information and the maps of the house and all that before he goes in, right? There's also obstacle that comes in when you go steal. You know they have money, but then like it's supposed to be somewhere, but then you go, you can't find it, right? Because people constantly move their value from one place to another. Okay, so Chandong could just choose an app. No matter how much he, he searched in the house, he couldn't find anything to steal. Del Tang should. He was really upset. He's like, man, I, I worked really hard to come and steal something, and there's nothing in this house. Parso Khabar should. The Zahid, he kind of had a feeling. He opened, like, you know, cracked his eyes, and he, he saw that there's a thief in his house. He's looking for something to steal. Galimi Kabaran Khuftabud, Dar Rahid Dost, and Dakh. So Mahroom Nashra. He had an expensive Galim. Galim is a, a carpet. And usually it's like the handmade carpet. That's the only valuable thing he had. He used to sleep on it. So he rolled and he took it out of like it, that was his little mattress basically sleeping on the floor with a little with a little carpet. So he took the carpet and he threw it on the way where when the thief is exiting the house so he can see it. And he takes it with him, so he doesn't leave disappointed from his house. I mean, what kind of people were they? Like, you just have to think about it. Shenidam ke mardan rahi khuda dil dushmanan ra nakardan tan. And then he, so that was the prose, the first part. That's called Nasr Musajja. And now this is the poem. He said, "I've heard that the people of God, these are what we call Rijal Allah, the people of God." They don't even want to hurt their enemies. They don't want to break the heart of their enemies. How could you achieve this maqam, this station, right? To become a zahid, to become a parsa, to become a man of God, right? To become the nay, how to become an insan al kamil, to become a saint. How could you reach that maqam, that station, when you're always arguing and fighting with your friends? That's how they treat their enemies. How do you think the Parsa and the Zahid and the men and women of God treat their friends? If that's how they treat their enemies. So he's saying you will never achieve that maqam because you're always arguing and fighting your, the, even the people that you claim that you love them, your friends. Muaddat ahl safa chi dar rui wa chi dar qafa. Na chanan kas tasad ayb giran wa pishad bish miran. So the people of Ahlul Safa. Ahlul Safa is the people of purity. The people like Zahid, the people who are uh, Parsa and pure. Either in front or in the back. Either in front of you and in your back. Because there's two relationships people have. This is, this is extremely important to know. The, the relationship we have when we are together, the relationship we have when, you know, the back in person, it's a beautiful word because when you depart, you turn your backs towards each other. And you depart, you go your separate ways. So now, you know, what are you going to talk behind his back? Is it going to be the same you talk to him in front of his back? What are you going to talk in front of her? Or is it going to be the same behind her? And this is one of the tragedies of our time. And I know, you know, when you do counseling, it, it just it breaks your heart to see people who, have, who were friends for like 10, 20 years, and they found out that their friends were betraying them and they were talking bad about them. And a lot of stuff that happened in their marriage life, in their family life, with their parents, with their teachers, with all in, in the, at, at work, it's all from their friends. And those people that they expected the least. And this is why the great, one of the greatest gifts in life is to have a good friend. And we've been blessed to have like really good friends. And, and this is now it's kind of impossible to, ha to find somebody that actually is a good friend who, who is the same in front of you and the same behind you. Who is someone, in, in one time I mentioned this, and a friend of mine called me uh, right after my class. We were in, I think it was, we were in Konya. We had a, class, had a teaching class on Rumi. And I said, their friends, I think about my friends is that if I have to leave 
or something happens to me, right? I have to go somewhere, and my wife is home alone with all our belonging and our wealth, right? Which one of my friends I would trust to say, hey, go sleep in my house to protect my wife and my wealth? And I know that he wouldn't touch either one, right? And, and that's how I think, and that's how I know, like, who are my friends? Like, these are the people I trust. So immediately one of my friends called, he goes, uh, Freydun, if ever happens to me, you are the only one. <laughs> I said, listen, you were number one on my list too, but I have four people on that list, which is amazing to have that, like, you know, that kind of that kind of people in your life. In any case, uh, and one of them sitting in this class is one of my good friends, and I trust him with my life. Uh, you know, people that you know for th three decades, just trust him. So that's that's the, that's the prerequisite um, for trust. Yeah, because all these young kids, like your kids when they're teenagers, they come to Baba, I'm going, my friends, my friends said, okay, you think they're friends? We'll talk about it 20 years ago. If you remember their name, then they're your friends. So he said, the people of Ahl Safa, whether in front of you or behind you, they won't say, uh, behind you, they will not say any aib. Aib is deficiency. It's a very important word. To, to learn this word, aib. Because when you have, I'll give you an example. If somebody is, is drinking alcohol, right? He's a man, but he's such a good man. Hardworking man, family man. But why he drinks alcohol? He has that, that's an aib. That's an aib. So he is good. He just has an aib. If he removes that, he's, he's all good, right? So you can remove Aib. Aib is, a, is an attachment to you. It's not part of you. Got it? So it's not your essence. So in logic, you have essence and you have accidents, right? So not accident like car accident, but accidents. In the accident, for example, the color of a rose is the accident. It, the, so you can't say, oh, that's not a rose because it's not red. Even if it's white, it's a rose. Even if it's blue, it's a rose. The rosiness is different from the color. So Aib is not your essence. So people, there are people who are good people. They give charity. They pray five times a day. They fast in Ramadan. They do, they're beautiful, but they have foul language. They always use like F-bomb. They just they have foul language. That's an Aib. They can let that go. They can purify themselves. They can say, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to speak foul again. And I know people... I mean, we grew up in this country in, in high school. We used to, I mean, it was normal. But there was a point in my life that I said, I will never, ever use foul word again in my life. And there was a point that I really wanted to use it. You just, you get frustrated uh, in this dunya. And I said, hey, I made an oath to myself and my Lord. I'm not going to use it. So you can do that. People can control their tongue if they want to. So that's the thing is aib is something. So if your friend has an aib, that's not part of their essence. For example, you have a friend that smokes cigarette or, you know, or backbite. You should tell them in a beautiful way so they can remove that aib and become that parsa, to become that zahid, that person that is pure from inside and outside. Instead of talking about it behind their back, where they're not there to, de to defend themselves, right? So we don't know. Allah knows, like, the people's situation. So he said, they will not, uh, behind you, they will not talk about your aib. And, and in front of you, in other words, the word means, you know, they don't die for you. One of the worst relationships is what I call an extreme relationship. So when you become friends with somebody or your family members, and then when you see them, you say, SubhanAllah, you're amazing, you're great, I miss you, I love you. You just keep going. And then the whole night you're like that. And then when you leave, it's done. That is a fake relationship. That's not real. Because if it was real, it would continue after that as well. Like nonstop, you know, you would text every day, you would call. That's, you know, that's like Layla Majnoon relationship with like 24 hours a day. Nobody's like that. So he's saying, don't go to the extreme in front. By over-praising, over-loving, overdoing things, 
And don't go to the extreme in the back where we'll you say, oh, you know what, look at him. Da, da, da. Like, talk about this. Look how hard he works. He neglects his children. You know, no, just tell him, listen, you're, you're working too hard. It's good. You're, you know, you're supposed to work hard. That's a good thing. But remember, just, just maybe take a couple hours extra off a week, spend with your kids. They miss you too. You know, it's important to get it going. You say it in a beautiful way. Advice. One of the things that I love about the Gulistan, and you can see this, he is giving advice to all of us. But look how beautiful he's given it to. He's not telling you, oh, you stupid man, what's wrong with you? Uh, you know, if a thief comes to your house, you probably get a gun and shoot him. Look at the people. Like, that's not what he's saying. He's just teaching us a lesson in a beautiful way. So always when you give advice, please do it in a beautiful way. So he says that in front of you, uh, they, and, and they don't die for you. They don't over-exaggerate. But behind you, they don't see your eye. That's, a, that's a, the real, the people of purity. And if you have friends like that, you should do two units of shukr prayer that Allah has blessed you with friends like that. Okay, so he has a poem, but we will go to the next one because I just looked at the time. We only have like 20 minutes. Okay, so we'll do one more. Uh, this is, uh, again, Akhlaq uh, Darwishan, uh, Hikaya number 13. Uh, so this is the story number 13, second chapter of the of the Gulistan. People, it translated, obviously, in English and other languages. People want to follow it in the original, in the English translation. So he says, Parsai ra didam bar kanar darya ke zakhm palang dasht. و به هیچ دارو به نمیشد. I saw this, this palang here doesn't mean the, the, the leopard. Right? So he says, I saw a parsa. Again, the word parsa comes here. I saw a parsa uh, in near a, a, a river that he had this zakhm. And in other words, he had this, this uh, uh, he, he was sick. And this, this he had this, this wound that was really uh, uh, incurable. It wasn't getting healed. Like literally, it was uh, it was it was horrible. It wasn't getting healed. No matter how much medicine he would take, no matter how many, you know doctors would come, medicine he wouldn't get healed. Right? No, no medicine could he, uh, would help him. For long periods of time, he was just. Uh, uh, in pain and suffering and in depression, sadness. You know, ranj, ranjur means someone who has ranj. And ranj is when you're, when you're down, right? When you have pain and suffering, but you're down. In, in pain and uh, uh, sickness can bring you down and, and make you depressed. And this is one of the reasons why hospitals, they all have that nice light blue color they paint it because it makes you happy. So people go there as sick people, so at least there's symbolism of happiness. And now, you know, uh, one, one of my friend, my cousin, uh, beloved cousin of mine had a surgery, a kidney surgery. He, he, he donated his kidney. And we went to visit him at Stanford Hospital. And I went to his room, walked in. I swear it was like a five-star resort. And an amazing view, giant window, this beautiful huge. I said, wow, this is amazing. He goes, oh, my. I'm, I told the doctor, I'm ready to go today. Like, I feel good. But I really don't want to leave this room because it's like a really nice room. So the nurse came in and I said, is it because you want them to, he goes, absolutely, you want them, this will make them feel happy and better and the colors and the window and it's all purposely built so they can get healed faster. So, so this man is basically, he's, he's down with this because obviously he doesn't have that, that hospital and that view. Uh, but Saadi says, وَشُكْرَ خُدَاءِ عَزَّ وَجَعْلْ عَلَى الدَّوَامُ گُفْتِ But he's, in a state of gratitude, saying, شُكُرْ يَا اللَّهُ شُكُرْ يَا اللَّهُ So he's, he's doing uh, shukr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, non-stop. He's saying, shukr alhamdulillah, shukr alhamdulillah. Kursi dandash. So they asked him, ka shukr chimihi. Why are you instead of shukr and gratitude? Well, what, are you, what are you making shukr for? Right? Here you are. You have a uh, chronic disease, painful wound, 
that's not being healed, you're taking medicine nonstop, nothing is healing it, and you're in constant pain and suffering. Why are you instead of shukr? Guf, he replied. Shukr on ke be musibati giriftaram, ne be maasiyati. So, if you can see those two words, musiba and maasiya, right? Both of them are Arabic. And you know why? We talked about this before. Any word that has the word sab in it is from Arabic, it's not original Persian. So, he says that I'm showing gratitude because I'm afflicted with a musibah, with a trial and tribulation from Allah, not with a ma'asiyah, not with a state of disobedience and sinfulness. In other words, i rather have pain, I'd rather have a wound, I'd rather be sick, than to be healthy and use that health against my creator in the state of sinfulness and ma'asiyah. And this is the wisdom that people don't understand. Sometimes you get sick and you're at home and you can't do anything, you can't go out. They say, oh, I wish I could get better. And then people say, you don't know. If you were better, you might be in a nightclub dancing. If you were better, you might be drinking. If you were better, you might be fornicating. If you were better, you might be stealing. So Allah's wisdom, we don't know. So he's saying, alhamdulillah, that I'm sick, but I'm not in state of sinfulness and disobedient to my Lord. گرما را زار و کشتن دهدان یار عزیز تا نگویی که در آن دم غم جانم باشد so if my beloved right is killing me in a worst way right because there's there's multiple way of 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 killing like the poet said you know uh, there's, there's a thousand ways to get to get killed but death is one right <laughs> you, you die. But there, there are a thousand ways of, of getting killed. Uh, uh, there, there's, a, there's an Afghani joke. Uh, I'm sure you will enjoy this, but you, you can only make fun of your own culture. If somebody else does it, you get offended. But you can do it on your own. So they say there's three Afghanis who were uh, who committed crime, and they said you're all, all of all three of you need to be killed. So they stood them in line. They said you have three choices. Uh, so the first choice is uh, is the sword, and we chop you and hit you until you die. Oh man, that's bad. The second one is the gun, and the bullet, one bullet, and then you're done. The third one is the guillotine. You, know, you just you put your head, you drop it, and it, it's the fastest, and, and you're done. So the one man said, "Man, just do the fastest. I, you know, I don't want to get tortured and get it done." So they put his head down and they released the guilty and it came right before his head, it blocked, it stopped. And the man said, oh man, he must be innocent, let him go. So he got jammed. So they let him go, he's happy, he's dancing, he's going. The second one said, what do you want to say? I want the guilty too, you know. He's, uh, he's hoping, you know, he get jammed again. So they put his head down, it comes in right before his head, it gets jammed and it stops. And then he said, oh, he must be innocent, let him, let him go to the third one. He said, what do you want? He said, Obviously, the guillotine is not working properly, so get the gun, please. So there are many ways to get killed, but uh, all of them goes to one. So he says, if I'm getting killed by the beloved, I die with a lot of, with, even with torture or whatever way it is, right? I don't want you to think for a moment that, you know, because if you're being killed, if you're being tortured and killed, it's, you know, you, it's painful, right? And people cry. It's, it's human nature, like no, nobody is made out of steel or rocks. So people cry. So if you are, if, if you see, he's saying, the, he's saying, if you see me crying, if you see me in, in the state of just, I just in, in, he said, I don't want you to think that, oh, I'm worried about my, 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 uh, my life. When I'm, oh, I, I have pain. So that's not what I'm crying for. That's not, that's not why. Don't you, the, 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 don't let the form that, that you see dilute you. That's not it. Because when you're getting killed, obviously somebody's going to cry. Obviously somebody's going to be in a state of uh, just shouting or whatever. He said, I'm not crying because I'm being tortured or because I, there's pain on my body. No, no, no. I'm saying, what wrong did I do? What wrong? 
What sin did I commit? کو دل آزرده شد از من غم آن غم آنم باشد What wrong What sin did I commit that my beloved is upset at me and he put me through this That is what I'm worried about I'm not worried about oh I'm going to be in pain I'm going to, but what sin did I do that Allah is sending this calamity on me right that Allah is upset at me That's what I'm worried about and this is the foundational teaching of Saadi We're living in a time that is the exact opposite of what we just read. Whenever something happens, what's wrong with other people? Why is he doing this? Why? In Saudi, in the entire Gulistan, there's so many lessons in here. As a matter of fact, I was reading another, uh, this chapter last night again. And in this chapter, he has beautiful advice that, you know, when calamities come, everybody thinks about, what did I do? Why is Allah sending to me? What wrong have I done? How could I rectify myself? How could I fix myself? This is the, 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 the vision. Now, the easiest way is to point finger at, at other people. But like they say, whenever you point finger at, at other people, three fingers you're pointing at yourself, one at the other. Because really, it is our fault. Everything that happens, we plant the seed. Every action of ours has a metaphysical re- reality. You can't have, you know, if you, if you, if you know, one of, one of the, the, the best uh, uh, commencement speeches ever given uh, in the, within the Western culture, not the Muslim culture, that, uh, that I've seen, there might be better ones, but that I've seen is uh, John Foster Wallace. Uh, and it's on YouTube. And everyone should watch that. Every Muslim should watch that. It's called This is Water. And in that, he talks about, uh, he gives all these stories about, he said, you know, you're driving down the freeway, and then here's this guy with his, this you know, lady with a huge SUV, the, you know, 12 cylinder that drives by you, and you're in your, you know, you know, in your car trying to save gas and save the planet, you know. And you say, like, what's wrong with this guy? And then you see this guy just cutting you, and then going like a crazy madman, right? And you almost had an accident, and just like, what's wrong with this person? And then you go into the grocery store, and then there's this overweight person in front of you with with hundreds of stuff on, on her shopping cart. Like, when is that going to be over? I'm standing in line. And, and so all of these incidents he talks about, like, and then at the end he says, what if, you know, what if that lady in a large SUV had a car accident when she was young and she feels insecure in small cars? She has to drive a big car, otherwise she can't drive. Just out of fear. What if the man who was driving, he has his child in the hospital and he just called that he's, a, he's about to die. So he's just trying to get to the hospital to give blood or something. Well, so he's telling all these in that basically the whole talk is from our perspective is about Hosna Dhan, to have good opinion of people. Like when, you, when some things, you know, when things happen, you make an excuse. The Prophet said, make 70 excuses for people. Right? And that 70 doesn't mean, you know, 1 through 70. That means just keep making excuses for people. Like, the, we, we live in an age that nobody wants to make an, make an excuse. If, if you do one wrong, many of the divorces in our community, and unfortunately it's on the rise, and uh, many of the divorces in our community, everyone that, that, that I was involved to, to uh, mediate has been over stupid stuff. And I tell you something, sometimes I it was really hard holding myself from laughter. Like literally when they were saying, this is what he did, this is what he did. I'm like, really? Like, uh, we all should have been divorced day three of our wedding. Like literally, if you go by that concept of, oh, no, like people have to be patient. You know, you just have to have husband or done. Like not everything that everybody says, they mean it. And one of my favorite things, is you know in in the uh, in the in the Persian uh, literature is about the the cursing of a mother because the mother they they, they curse their children like they literally say may you die like a, a mother would say that she, they get upset may you die you know may you may you go to hell like they say these stuff to their children and until you don't become a parent you don't know like there's no way. I can explain to you the love of a father to a child. 
There's no until you your father, you know. Those who know know, those who don't know don't know. Right? Children would never know what does it mean to be a father. What like how much their father loves them and how much their mother loves them. They would never know this until they become a father themselves. And then it's too late because now their love has gone to their children that they can't give that level of love to their parents because everything within human being is limited. There's nothing unlimited in, in, within us, right? Even the breath are limited. You have a certain breath, you inhale and exhale. Once it's done, you, you're gone. Say, say, say goodbye to your life. The last breath, you inhale, you can't exhale because it's done. It's a chest with a with, with, uh, number of breaths that Allah allocated for each and every one of us. Some of them has only one. They, they, they are born, they inhale, they can't exhale, and they're done. Some has thousands. And whatever number of breath it is, that's what Allah has allocated. So everything is, 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 and love is like that too. So people, you know, that's why like when people give all this love to the material things, where do you have the love for Allah and his messenger and your children and your spouses and your parents and your family and the community? So that's the thing that, you know, like a lot of these, these things, they fall apart is because we always, we don't give an excuse to our spouses, to our children. Like sometimes children say stupid stuff and then we try to, uh, you know, court martial them, right? Like literally. I remember when I was young, I said a lot of stupid stuff. Uh, I still do sometimes. Uh, I actually had a conversation. I'm, I'm uh, one of, uh, a good friend of mine, I've been helping him out, uh, coaching him for a few years. And he's a beautiful man, convert, uh, very, very smart, super duper smart. And... Uh, so he said, we were just talking right before the class. Like, man, that was one of the reasons I was late, I think. I didn't look at my watch. And he said that I say stupid stuff. So, uh, and I'm turning at this age. So, I, And we, we, I said, you know, uh, Abdul Qadir Vidal, Rahmatullah Ali said, Giran ke aqli kul bi junun mabash. He said, even if you're the most intelligent human being on this planet, know that madness is like a shadow walking with you. You could, you could say something really stupid, even if you're a genius. And how many geniuses we have seen, they said stupid stuff. Like people like, you know, like everybody, like I don't want to mention name, but even in the West, Western culture, the people who are like, you know, how could this man with like four PhDs say something so stupid? Like all these people who are, you know, they think they know religion and look at their, their view on Islam. They say stupid stuff. I'm like, really? Like, you, you you didn't read anything about Islam. What did you read? What do you know? And you're supposed to be an expert on Islam. And the same thing with engineering. With, but the most thing is within marriage. People sometimes say stupid stuff, right? But especially one of the things you don't want to do, you don't want to court-martial your children with everything that slips out of their tongue. You pretend as you didn't hear it. That's the better way, right? Because sometimes they say stuff out of anger or, or, or they just want to. But if you just do that, it will have a better, so they would know that, oh, oh, five minutes, alhamdulillah, he didn't hear it, right? You pretend he didn't hear it, you just keep yourself busy, and then, like, and then you pretend as a normal conversation, hey, how, what's going on? You, you want to go do this? You want to eat? So this way, relationships are not ruined, because once that door opens, where there's no honor and respect between father and the son and the daughter, or the mother and the son and the daughter, that, that, that's, that's a dysfunctional household. So you have to make sure, uh, but then you discipline discipline them through teachings and also through being a character yourself. If you are not practicing what you preach, it's not going to work in the household. So, uh, yeah, 3.56. So, good timing. Jazakallah uh, khair. I think I covered everything in here. Is everything, was everything on that thing covered today? Yeah? Okay, awesome. So thank you very much uh, to everyone here. Thank you, Jazakallah Khair, to uh, uh, Mufti Sahib Abdul Wahab. Uh, Jazakallah Khair for all the brothers at Miftah and uh, everyone who's watching this. And uh, may Allah bless all of you. And this is the uh, work of the great uh, Saadi Shirazi, a Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah Sunni scholar uh, from Persia, from Iran, what is modern day Iran. And he, with a immense love for Allah, the Prophet, the Khulafa, 
Uh, and if you if you read the the Bostan and just the first poem of the Bostan, it will tell you how much love he had for Allah, for His Messenger, and for the Sahabas. Uh, in this sense, so and we'll end with the greatest poem ever written about the Prophet uh, There's a lot of poems like the Burda and uh, Imam Busiri wrote one of the most amazing poem. But I'm, when I'm talking a poem, I'm talking about the shortest poem about the Prophet ever written and with the, with the highest meaning that everyone in Arab world and the Ajam world memorized it and, they, and it was 